OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Half past seven, Friday morning. Very good morning to you. Welcome along to OTB AM. Watching the game last night. Any thoughts on it? Do lash them into us this morning. We'll bring them to our audience over the course of the morning. Shane Hannon, come on in. Good morning, Adrian. How are things? Oh, great. I'm buzzing, obviously, after the game last night. And, uh, you know, lots to get into on that front. We'll do that in just a couple of moments' time. But, first of all, you were tweeting last night uh, a, a nostalgic picture, Shane, of memories of your own first Republic of Ireland game. Your first cap. My first cap, yeah. My first attendance at an Ireland match. I was only a kid. I think I was seven, maybe. Um, this is the reason Andorra is my second team, Adrian, and brings back fond memories for me. So it was April 2001, uh, World Cup qualifier for the 2002 World Cup, of course. 3-1 win for Ireland. Uh, Kilban, Breen and Kinsella among the goals for Ireland. Um, and the reason it kind of popped into my head and I had a bit of a, a double take yesterday is because the goal scorer for Andorra last night, or sorry, that night in 2001, was the 21-year-old Ildefons Lima, who last night at 41, 20 years later, came off the bench mm. um, and uh, came onto the pitch, you know, breaking... Was it Yari Littman's feat yeah. of international football in, in four Even decades? he was laughing so, at it when he was coming on. He was sort of looking around and laughing at everybody going, ha <laughs> ha, stay to me. Yeah, it's like, what's going on? Yeah. So I have the match programme uh, from that night. You have the lovely um, Ian Hart, if you can probably mm. see that. Ian Hart looking like something out of Westlife. Uh, signed by Ian Hart as well at the front. I used to hang around the back of Lansdowne Road, get players' autographs. Uh, so that was one I got. But one memory from that night is Ildefons Lima uh, got onto the Andorra team bus as I was looking for autographs. Um, came back off the bus, handed seven-year-old me a little Andorra pin. Now, I was trying to look around for it last night. A flag of the Andorra, a, a pin of the Andorran flag. Um, and so when he came off the pitch last night, I always remembered his name. And I was thinking, how is this guy still playing? So for that reason, my memories of that match, uh, as my first game at Lansdowne Road, and my memories of Andorra generally are very positive. So I just had a flick through the programme. Like Pat Quigley in his notes talking about Andorra being the size of County Louth, a population of 60,000 people, so around the size of, of Monaghan. A beautiful photograph of Roy Keane in the back, dressed uh, as a samurai, of course, ahead of the, the World Cup in Japan and South Korea uh, the following summer. Do you think he and actually then, put that stuff on him, or do you think they fo was Photoshop a thing in 2001? It looks very, very like it was him. Here, Roy, um, will you just put this samurai... samurai a suit on well he did dress up no, in a thanks. suit for a Walker's Crisp Sad I think years that ago as true. well so he wasn't he wasn't against it uh, Mick McCarthy dressed in his absolute best here hopefully you can see that for a pennies ad Mick always so, puts his best side out Mick looking very well mm. uh, yeah and the subheading managing to look this good is easy so uh, a lovely little image of Mick McCarthy yeah, and then there's a nice little kind of precursor to Saipan in this as well hopefully you can see this photograph in the bottom corner here. So it's Mick with his head in his hands. I'm going to try and move it over Gary Doherty there, you. yeah. Gary Doherty kind of superimposed. So superimposing in Photoshop was actually a thing, Adrian. But mm. uh, a lovely photo of Roy and Mick in training in 2001 ahead of this game against Andorra. Roy kind of smirking over at Mick McCarthy and Mick with his head in his hands. Uh, an omen, perhaps, of what was to come just over yeah. a year later in Saipan. So uh, some nice little nuggets in that program. But yeah, but, uh, the... Uh, it foretold, Happy memories for me. foretold the future, Shane. Um, indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah. So, um, Ildefons Lima is, is my, uh, is my favorite Lima, There we go. Looking at the, uh, the the goal last night, actually, was they weren't that dissimilar, the goal that night in 2001 to the goal mm. that Andorra scored last night. Um, we'll Let's take a bit of reaction to the game. We've, we've lots to get into. We're going to talk to Matt Holland about it later on as well, but we'll take a bit of reaction to the game. We're going to start off here, Stephen Kenny, uh, talking about that Andorra goal. We didn't... Uh, we didn't um, concede any goals from set pieces since I took over, except the second phase against England. You know when it was we cleared it out and then they knocked it back in for Harry Maguire. Harry Wings picked it up and in the friendly and knocked it back in after on the second phase. But we haven't conceded a goal from a set play. But that was a poor one today. It's no doubt about that from a wide free kick. So I'll have to have a look at that. Um, it's not something we've been focusing on um, defending set pieces because. You know, there's only so much, you know, we, we haven't had that long, you know, we've only had four days or, five, you know, five days or whatever, because you have to give a day off in between that, you know. Uh, so you can train every day coming into a match. So it's, um, we haven't been focusing on defending set pieces and trying to, working on sort of 
creative elements of our game if we can within the different systems. But um, the um, but no, it was a bad goal to concede today. There's no getting away from that, and uh, it's not like us to concede a goal like that from a wide free kick. And I don't, I don't like that. It's somewhat unusual to hear an international manager say that they haven't been focusing on defending set pieces. I would have thought that was first on the checklist of things to get done when they come in. But look, it's understandable and, and maybe he's just being more honest than other managers would be when they're in that position. But the concession, uh, I mean, if they never worked on defending a free kick, the concession of that goal last night against a team ranked 158th in the world and we were all at sea, it wasn't as if there was a lot of pressure on this guy to, to head it home from fairly close range. It definitely, definitely gives cause for concern. Yeah, and I think a lot of people at halftime were pro- possibly questioning their choice to watch the game um, and thinking this is absolutely abysmal. Uh, as you said, 158th in the world, 111 places below ourselves. Um, and when it's eight days out from a from a major tournament like the Euros and we're here hoping to nick a win against the Andorans, it kind of puts things in perspective a little bit, makes you a little bit fearful. But, you know, we had to stay positive. Um, and luckily, luckily things looked up, but... The the Andorra goal was abysmal, um, mm. and and like how much do you look into it? Do you do you focus on the the fact that it was nil nil at halftime against Andorra, the fact that we went one nil behind, or do you then focus on all the positives that came in the second half? Well, I, mean, I, I think you tap into something, Shane, because I think that that I think we we should not forget that first sixty minutes. Like we can't be, we can't just override everything because the result was right at the end, and it was great to get the goals and there was like positives out of it. Obviously, Jason and I played really well. The goals from Troy Parrott when eventually the urgency came in, started to come into our game after we had one behind. Like that's all good stuff, but we cannot forget. Like I the the management team for me after sixty minutes when we're behind. I, their jobs are on the line at that point. Like somebody somewhere is thinking, this is really not working out. And and if we can't grind out something against a team ranked ranked 158 in the world, like I think they're half an hour from some serious conversations about the future of this the Republic of Ireland management team. Now they they got it done in the end and we get over the line and and like there is an element of hopefully we can bank that win and go on and kick on. But mm. really worrying large portions of worrying. Uh, of worry for that for that management team and for this team going forward. Like it's it, when relief is the biggest emotion out of a game against Andorra, it's not good. And like like with the manager being on the line, that's that's a serious thing because that shows the pressure of international football. The fact that pe- like like yourself and other Irish fans are thinking in the middle of the game. I saw some people tweeting, "Can you actually sack a manager mid game when it was one nil down?" And those whatever five six seven minutes between the Andorra goal and the equaliser from Troy Parrott were the longest six minutes ever um and twitter was a buzz with people just saying this is this is atrocious mm-hmm. and like i know john egan was speaking in the, in the build-up kind of saying we want to give the country a team they're proud to support but when i saw the lineup and you see names like cullen and curtis and knight and o'Shea it, it makes you excited and parrot as well you're thinking this is going to be great this is you know a, a bit of a chance to score some goals uh, and then they go one nil down you're thinking oh no this is this is going to be luxembourg 2.0 Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that they came back and did the job, we'll 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 never we won't remember this game for for the fact that we went one nil one nil behind. We'll just look back in the annals of history and see we had a four one win in Andorra. So um, if if things look up for Stephen Kenny and, and he can can you know the positive is we we scored four goals. It might have been against Andorra, but the celebrations after the Troy Parrot equaliser uh, from the players. If you look around the players on screen at that moment, they're all going fairly fairly crazy for a friendly. Uh, it shows how much it meant to them. They knew that they needed to get a win, uh, and that was the start of the comeback. Yeah. So, a big, a big result, but yeah, not not perfect by any stretch. Yeah, it is, look, it is one of those games that is a bit of a hiding to nothing. Like no matter if you beat them four one, you just would have hoped it was more comprehensive, more controlled, more incisive, more positive, progressive, whatever word you want to use around it. There was times where we just it just felt lads, we're playing Andorra here. And uh, as one of our YouTube commenters uh, points out this morning, Mark Allen, uh, good to know our level, beating Andorra. Um, and for now, that's kind of where we're at. Let's take a quick clip of uh, the man of the match last night, Troy Parrott, after his couple of goals. You, you said it. Um, it's been a tough season, to be fair. I've got a lot of criticism. Um, it's finished the way I wanted it to go the whole the whole time. Um, but teams don't really always got the plan, and I'm really really happy to to finish the season strong. Has it been tough then to take on board that criticism, and, and what are your plans for next season? Do you know where you'll be? Uh, I wouldn't. 
wouldn't say it's tough to take it on. Um, obviously, no one wants to be to be criticised, um, but it pushes me and makes me want to do do even better. Um, on next season, I'm not too sure what's going to happen, um, so I can't really say much on that. Sorry, not to harp on the criticism, but is it because you were such a big name as a teenager, you're still a teenager, aren't you, but because there was a lot of expectation on your shoulders that you were sort of maybe judged differently and hadn't been able to develop? Uh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, I'm not too sure. I try not to pay attention to that too much. Um, I want to concentrate on my football and ultimately score on goals. Yeah, and we're just not sure about Tri Parrot just yet. Obviously, a huge amount of expectation on him. A couple of goals in 18 games at Ipswich at that level, you would have hoped maybe for more. But again, when you look at the game last night, and you look at the composure of him to, to bag in those couple of goals again. Maybe that can be the thing that drives this guy onto greater things and to establish himself at wherever it is, he says himself there, that he ends up next season. The step up to senior football is obviously a big one, and it hasn't happened for him yet, really, you'd have to say. But maybe last night can be the cat catalyst for that there's a nation hoping that it will be and we'll follow it with interest over the next while obviously hungry to come in a couple of days too and we'll um, look ahead to that in a little bit but it is uh, 7.42 on this Friday morning delighted to have you along with us uh, OTB AM live in association with Gillette good mornings start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead a bit of a flavour of what's coming up between now and 10am uh, with myself and Shane we're going to talk to Jim McGuinness fascinating conversation that uh, we're going to bring you away in a couple of moments time Matt Holland is going to pick through the game in Andorra last night and uh, there's loads to get into if you have comments for Matt or questions for him opinions whatever it is fire them into us we'll put them to Matt a little bit later in the show um, the <laughs> Rod squad um, we'll say no more on that um, although Shane will be called out in, in a little bit we'll be talking a little bit about the Rod squad uh, the sports pages let you know what's going across obviously dominated heavily by the football last night so we'll uh, bring those your way at about half past eight this morning after that Alan Quinlan and lots of interesting stuff including at the back page of the Examiner this morning uh, links with uh, Donica Ryan with a coaching role with La Rochelle no less. So we'll get his thoughts on that and a few more other bits and pieces as well. Shane has been uh, speaking to Eilish and Emer Considine and that'll be coming your way just after, an interesting chat coming your way just after uh, nine this morning and uh, we'll bring you some of this week's football pod with Andy Moran and Paddy Andrews as well. So that's at uh, 9.30 this morning. But do keep your comments coming into us, as I said. Football or anything else that is a... On your mind this morning, do get your comments coming into us. And as I said, Matt Holland will be with us just after eight this morning. So stay tuned for all of that. First, uh, Shane and myself sat down with Jim McGuinness yesterday. It was the launch of Sky Sports GEA coverage for the summer and a uh, fascinating chat. Enjoy. OTB AM. All right, you're watching OTB AM and uh, as part of Sky Sports 2021 GA season launch announcing their 2021 championship fixtures. It includes 18 live matches, 12 of them exclusive to Sky. Delighted to be joined by the Sky Sports panellists, former Donegal manager, of course, Jim McGuinness. How are you, Jim? How are you doing? How are you doing? Very impressive uh, background there. And we're all getting <laughs> back to our restaurants very shortly. <laughs> well, but the all to it. It's definitely not my picking, to be honest with you. Now. I've got a bit of a shock myself when I logged on there. But anyway. I think it's important to, 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 point, to pe uh, point out to people that that is just <laughs> it's a background rather than you being sat in a restaurant. I, I had planned to ask you where you were at in the world and, and how life was and how things are going, so uh, maybe that's the best jumping off point. <laughs> no, definitely, yeah. Uh, I've had a lovely lunch there and I'm um, looking forward to dessert. <laughs> <laughs> nice Italian. Where, where are you? How are you keeping? I'm in Donegal. I'm looking out here at the hills of Donegal here, at the back window of the house here, and um, the sun is shining. Beautiful. It's it's. Um, I don't know if it's been lost in you or not, but you've kept us in chat over the last few months. There's always a Jim McGuinness conversation in in any given week about where you're at, where you're up to, who you might be joining, who you're not joining. What are you up to on a on a day to day? Kaiser Sosie. Um, at the moment, I'm working actually with the the Dairy Under 19s. Um, friend of mine, Jared Boyle, uh, is a coach there, and Sean Holmes. And um, and so we had a couple of chats in the off season, and I'm in working with them now. Uh, we're in the middle of pre season, coming to the end of pre season, thankfully. Um, so I've really enjoyed that. It's been great fun, um, good banter with the coaches, and uh, getting a good bit of work done with the players as well, and uh, a good wee group as well. Some talented players in there, and um, and looking forward to the start of the season with that. And then just on in terms of myself, like 
waiting for that right moment or opportunity if something comes up then you know that i can i can jump from that and and, and make a decision you know but it's great to be back on the pitch uh you know working with players again and and just running sessions and and developing things you know um that's been really really enjoyable because of lockdown and stuff um you, you miss it you really do miss it and is the the what are you doing with the 19s I just coach, just coaching them, just working with the other two coaches, and we're all just coaching them, you know. And um, they're they're in the uh, the national league on the nineteen national league competition, uh, the FEA competition, and so we're just getting ready for for uh, for blast off in a couple of months' time. We'll ask you the other question in a little bit, but to stay with the GEA for the minute, what um, where is Jim McGinnis at in twenty twenty one in terms of your GEA ambitions? My wife's gonna bring me in a cup of coffee here. We've only been speaking. Uh, we've only been speaking football since nine o'clock this morning with, uh, <laughs> with this media day. So, uh, so you'll excuse me. I have a cup of coffee here. I was in, on my desk. Get, get stuck in. Um, but uh, in terms of the Gaelic, you're asking me. Yeah. Where, where uh, are you at? What are you? What are you thinking? Have you? I'm. I'm sure that you're constantly thinking about what you're going to do with your. With you know, what's the next step? What's the next phase? Where are you going to get involved? You've spoken before about your your ambitions around the GEA scene. What What are you thinking, or what has it changed at all in the last 12, 24 months? No, I'm not thinking of Gaelic at all at the moment. Like other than sort of covering it, and and I really, really enjoy that. Like, and, and I suppose that keeps you close to the action anyway. Um, you know, um, you know, you're watching the games, you're analysing the games, you're reviewing the games, and the work with with the times as well allows you to do that. So you're always close to the action in terms of trends and in terms of, you know, teams and who's pushing and who's not pushing and things like that, you know. But other than that, I'm, I'm just focused on the other thing, you know. I'm just enjoying it. We're, we're doing four nights a week at the minute, you know, with, with pre-season. Um, and you, most of the other nights are on the phone anyway and you're talking about it. So it's, um you know, if, if life has taught me anything, is you, you, you can't have your focus on two things, you know. Um, and so if you're you're doing something that you're you're focused on that and you're committed to that and and um, trying to move forward on that front, and that's yeah. kind of where I'm at. Jim, I'm just curious now when you're when you're working with under an under nineteen setup, like you know you're, we're talking ten years on now since that great Donegal team in 2011, mm. 2012. Like you know young young fellas nowadays have different distractions. They've they've got social media. They've got a huge amount of things on their minds as well, and, and leaving cert issues as opposed to when you're dealing with the senior boys. So how, how do you compare, you know, walking into a dressing room with young lads now and maybe the difference in maybe walking into a dressing room 10 years ago with, with a group of senior players? Uh, you know, well, you see, I suppose I was fortunate that, uh, on. I was fortunate that I had the precursor with the under 21s, you know, uh, before I went into the senior job and the under 21s with Donny Gall. Um, this is very, very similar situation, you know, they're, you know, uh, if, if I ever, you know, do a corporate talk or whatever, I always, uh, I always put up uh, a picture and a PowerPoint of, of a red setter, uh, and and ask the audience uh, why it's up there in a footballing context, you know, and uh, in the context of under twenty ones, and you'll always get, uh, you know, because uh, it's the symbol on the the ro the the uh, bus errand, you know, that you're you're going on a journey and this type of thing, you know, but it's never that. It's always because. I don't know if you've ever had a red setter or not, but they've got an endless amount of energy, uh, not a lot of sense, bouncing about the place, you know, uh, just absolute fun. And um, and that's that was the under 21s. That's what we had. Like, you know, they're just great fun, great to be around and great atmosphere and not taking themselves too serious at the same time, really hungry for information. Their bodies are still developing. So the strength side of things, the nutrition side of things, you know, all those things are still really, really important to them. And, uh, and then obviously the tactical sides of things, um, you know, that they haven't seen it all and done it all like a senior pro um, or a senior player, you know, would have. So they're, they're like sponges. They're very much like sponges. Uh, and so that's been very, very refreshing over the last uh, couple of months, working with the young lads again and and sort of uh, that aspect of it, you know. And then there's parts of the senior game, you know, that you miss as well, you know, the in the more serious stuff and the serious analysis and, you know, the training sessions, the level, you know, the the, the very, very high intensity levels and, and technical levels that, that senior players bring and expect. But but it's been great fun, you know. Um, we're, we're we're training the night again and uh, looking forward to it. I was telling, I was saying on the show a few weeks ago that my old neighbour here from Kerry was telling me that the reason that uh, that they beat Galway by so much was that you were in working the Galway lads to you were flogging them and the the the, the, the too many miles in the legs. 
Are you working with any other counties? Are you doing? Are you dipping in and out, or or is it just no. so focus on Derry? Yeah, no, just 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 the focus there with the young lads at the moment. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm not working with anybody, or I don't have any plans to work with anybody at the moment. No, just um, just seeing how that goes and looking to develop myself as a person and as a coach, and um, and if the right opportunity comes, then. What's the rental market like in Dundalk? The what? Sorry. The rental, the rental market. market. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been in Dundalk. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, in my life, I've, I've probably drove past it a, a million times. But um, but no. But then all um, sorts of sightings around petrol stations and. Uh, <laughs> and oh, that's possible. Out. That's that's probably possible on your way to Dublin for for bits and pieces. Yeah. You know. What uh, is there any truth in it? No, listen. There was there was conversations and there was communications and stuff, you know. And uh, we'll see where that goes uh, moving forward. Um, as I said about fifteen different times over the course of today, uh, all those things are are, are private. And um, and so if if something does develop and something moves forward on that front or any other front, um, I think it's important that confidentiality is important. And I'm a private person anyway. Uh, and you know, whenever you've got something to say, you've got something to say. Uh, as not, you know, I don't, I don't believe in sort of links and commenting and links and speculations and all that. I think, I think, I think they're a nonsense, really, because you know, to go to, to get into any club, you know, you've got to be a fit for the club. The club has got to be a fit for you. There has to be a vision, you know, in terms of the club and what they want to do. What's success? What's not success? What you know? What do you want to achieve? You know, what do you bring to the table? Where does all those things match? So there's there's probably 20 or 30 or 40 places where the thing can fall down, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, getting getting um, somewhere where you think that you'll feel comfortable and you think that'll work both ways is is the most important thing. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's that's kind of where it's at. Yeah, and, and that's fair enough and totally understood the, the private nature of those things. Can we continue the conversation then away almost from Dundalk, if that's all right? Because it, uh -huh. it is a conversation that comes up in relation to your crossover over the last while. I think people sort of have the impression that you're Johnny come lately into it, obviously, and you've been at it for the best part of 10 years or more, obviously, at this point. Yeah. We'd, um, we'd, we'd, you know, that your credentials as a crossover. We had Shane Curran on a couple of weeks back, and he's had a foot in both as a player, League of Ireland and, and GA, mm -hmm. and he said it's nearly impossible uh, to be a manager in both or, or to swap. Where do you see yourself at in terms of that conversation, Jim, around your football credentials? How much of a football man in terms of soccer um, that you are? And and like, yeah, like like as I said, there are there are certainly a lot of people that have voiced their opinion about you who who mm. uh, who who are in the world of soccer and and about your credentials as a football man. How do you view yeah. all that? Well, I don't, to be honest with you. You know, you, you, your biggest critic is yourself. And there's no doubt, like, you know, and I've always said this from, from the get-go, you know, you're starting off at the lowest rung of the ladder and you're looking to rise to the highest rung of the ladder. That's ultimately what you're trying to do. Um, for football people, like soccer people, you know, everything that would be sort of instinctive to them and that they would take for granted, I had to learn and I had to develop and I had to try and create an understanding around that um, and 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 that's what I set about doing uh, and then on top of that then you've got to be studying the game you've got to study you know all the teams that are out there what they do how they do it why why do they do it uh, how to press why why to press that way why to press another way why to play this system over that system the pros and the cons of, of every system um, and then how to take all those systems down you know, you need a plan for that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the middle of all that, you're trying to shape your own philosophy. How would I do this? How do I see the game? How do I visualize the game? And then sometimes it's, it's difficult to move away from your own sense of um, what you what what you would hold close to your heart, you know. So I don't think I would agree with Shane. I don't think I think it can be done uh, or else I wouldn't be doing it um, mm -hmm. in, in one instance. Um, but I think it is a journey as well. Um, and I can, you know, it's funny, like, because I done a bit of work with you, Martin, and 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 Louth last year, and you know, when we were trying to win a county championship with them, and it was really interesting because I hadn't been on a Gaelic field for a while, you know, mm. and the first fifteen minutes of being on the pitch, like, I was lost, um, because I was thinking yeah. the other way all the way, uh, and I was thrown by it, like, and it was like, whoa, you know, that's great, though. Uh, isn't it? I mean, as as a, as somebody who that's that's brilliant, like, you're thinking in another language. I think in another language, and then after 15 minutes, I was fine. I, like, I was 100%, and then that was me, and I was away again. 
and I was, you know, heading in loads of different directions. But I thought that was that was that was a good moment, you know. And even with the 19s and Derry, like I do a lot of the coaching, like, you know, and we're pushing them uh, physically, we're pushing them tactically, you know, we're we're trying out things, you know, and um, and I do have a very clear sense of what the game looks like in my own head um, and how I want that to, to look like on the pitch. Mm. Um, and so so all those things I'm comfortable with now. Um, and like, you can't stop people from talking, like, you know what I mean? And you can't stop people from criticising you, you know, but... The only thing you can do is be true to yourself and try to keep moving forward and prove everybody wrong. Ultimately, that's that at the end of the day, that's what it is. And people that really, really put the boot in, you know, those are the people that you're trying to prove wrong more than anybody else, you know, at the end of the day, you know, because um, you know, if the criticism is harsh, like even when you're a Gaelic manager, do you know what I mean? Um, it's not yourself, it's more people around you or, or family and stuff, and things like that can, can be difficult. But I also am you know, I do understand where people would go, well, like, I mean, that's never going to work, like a Gaelic man, get into that, and you know, mm -hmm. but I I don't, I don't agree with that now, um, because I'm in it so long, and 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 I've studied the game so much, and and how I see the game is so clear in my mind, um, and so, uh, you know, um, a big thing is the right club, a big thing is recruitment, um, you know, I need a certain type of player to play the game the way that I want to play it, and, and I suppose everybody does. You know, uh, in terms which of, is what? of their philosophy, but which what, is what? high intensity. You know, it's aggressive, it's high pressing. You know, it's it's asking questions of the opposition. A bit like Donegal, it's it's ruffling teams psychologically. You know, uh, with intensity, but you need good players in the middle of the park that can put their foot on the ball. You know, you need athletes at fullback. You need centre halves that can build attacks, that can step in, that can create incision moments. Um, and then from a from a, a build up play, you know, you need that connection between that first line, the middle line, playing it out to play it in, to play it in, to play it out, you know, and you need pace up front for me, you know, uh, pace up front would be very, very important because, you know, come back to me, Gilly Cruz, you know, it's, I like to get the ball in behind and ask that question. I think, I think Chelsea did that very well in the final. I think they, um, ask, you know, they yeah. mixed their game up really well. Yeah, I mean, they, they had a defensive plan. Mm. They, they forced City to play through them, um, but they also mixed it up really well. They had good pace, they had good runners. They played those passes early, and even if it didn't work out, you know, they're they're up and they're, they're squeezing spaces and stuff, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, you need a certain type to to play that, and you need a certain type here as well. Um, yeah, and, I mean, and that's, har that's harder to get you, isn't all, it? That, sorry to cut across you. That's harder Not to get really. in almost when you're when you're you know with with all, all respect to obviously the, the you know in the Chinese league and and with with Charlotte like it's it's hard to I understand exactly what you're saying in terms of the quality the skill level the mentality of a player they tend to be the players that reach the very top um, and maybe even a, maybe even a Dundalk in some regards but but it, it makes it your job almost harder does it that that like it'd be easier to walk into a Chelsea obviously and uh, and deal with that caliber of player. Uh, well, it all depends on the players that are there. You know, it all depends. Like, I mean, like uh, uh, number 10 and inverted commas, like, you know, um, would struggle in a system like this. You know, and if you look at a lot of the, the big teams that are playing a high intensity pressing game now, that, that position doesn't exist anymore because mm -hmm. you just can't have that luxury um, where people sort of stroll about the place waiting to, you know, to link play and make connections. You know, it's, it's more of a three midfielders or four midfielders that are aggressive and up on it and asking questions. And the nine, now a lot of the time, the nine is the false nine and they're the person making the connections rather than than the 10, you know? Um, and so, no, I, I think it just depends what you have. Like what I was going to say there um, a second ago, when I was looking for players in Donegal, you know, the question that I used to always ask myself when I was at club games was, can he do it in one hand? Uh, and then the second question was, does he want to do it? And the second question is the more important question because at a professional level, most of them can do it. That doesn't mean they want to. Do you know what I mean? Most yeah. of them have the capacity. They're training every day. They play every day. But do they have the mentality? You know, and so if you look at teams like Leeds, you know, like Salzburg, like Leipzig, like Liverpool, um, even Chelsea, you know, even though they've played a low block since he's come in, his principles would be would be in line with those other clubs normally. Um you need you need athletes, you need runners, and you need guys that want to do it, you know. And I remember Jurgen Klopp speaking about Salah um, you know, when he came into the club that he wants to run in behind. 
So if you have a player that wants to do that, then implementing your philosophy becomes much more easier than having a player that you know can do it, but you've got to say, can you give us more in behind? Can you give us more in behind? You know what I mean? So yeah. you're you're pushing a message all the time in one hand, whereas in the other hand, the guy wants to do it anyway. And yeah. so if you've got midfielders, you know, that are feisty, uh, like Milner and these guys and, and Henderson that are aggressive, you know, they love that battle, they love that challenge, but are good football players into the bargain. It's a perfect mix, you know? Mm. Um, and so recruitment uh, is huge. Can I ask you a little bit? It's it's slightly tangential, but it certainly brought to mind as you were talking there, uh, Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore on the football pod, uh, the brilliant football pod that's uh, come on stream from OTB over the last few weeks. Uh, we're talking this week about the 2014 game and Paddy was saying about how that game was a line in the sand, that it changed Dublin forever, that that that, that sort of you going up against that man-to-man setup and and moving players around and changing the the position of it and it was just it was a really interesting point and it struck me a that you were to blame for the six in a row jim that that was very firmly at your door which but nobody me, in dublin has thanked me for yet <laughs> i can only imagine i can only imagine b i did wonder um that was 2014 and and everything you did around that time in 2021 where you see the game because like even when you talk about the gag and press there and um Joe brawley has been writing about the heavy metal football uh, uh, over the last few weeks as well. Where where is it felt like a boom time almost for for GA tactics in the you know sort of 10, 12, 13 years ago. Where is it at now? Is it is it still progressing? And, and what sort of phase are we in at the minute? A Gaelic football, yes. Uh, Gaelic football will always progress, and it would all it will always develop, and it would always evolve. I think uh, at the moment you have a very interesting dynamic at play in, in in a couple of contexts. Number one, you've got the best team in the country, Dublin, um, who are creating a huge dynasty. Uh, now they don't have a weak link. You know they don't have a line in the team where there's a question being asked of them. You know they've got competition in every single line. And they've morphed from, um, you know, a, a, a dynamic swashbuckling kicking team to uh, a very, very cultured, intelligent, um, conscientious possession-based team uh, that can transition when that moment pops up. But you know, they will keep the ball and they will use the ball and they will they will drag you to one side of the field to put it to the other side of the field to inject pace and and on all those types of things. What's interesting is for me is all the other coaches in the country are sort of following the offensive model that is Dublin. Um, and they're, you know, and, you, and that's reflected in the scores, like I said it earlier, yeah. uh, 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 in the launch for 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 the, the GA for the Sky coverage. Um, when did we move from you know Gaelic football to Hurling? Because all the score lines now are Hurling score lines. You know, it's 421 and it's 118 mm-hmm. and it's 223. And you know, that this and is, Ulster football leading the way, by the way. <laughs> Aye, and this is this is this is this is standard, you know. Yeah. But but there's a paradox here for me, and the paradox is that Dublin, to my mind, were the most defensive team in the country last year. Uh, like we were at the games and we were watching the games, and the 15 players and say their own for 65, almost every single attack. Uh, and I don't feel that they get the credit for that that they deserve on the one hand, but I feel that it's whitewashed over as well because they're so good going forward. And I think there's a fundamental flaw with the teams that are trying to follow them in the sense that they're taking the Newcastle approach. They're trying to, you know, outgun everybody and, and do the same at the other side. But there's no doubt in my mind, Dublin were the most sophisticated defensive system. In the first third, when they were pressing high, the way that they did it, the way they got people to the sideline, the way they created 2v1s, then maybe trying to push out that to a 3v1 and won the ball high up in the field. The way they did it in the middle third with, with extra bodies and then in the final third, the contact that they brought. They brought more contact than anybody else. Like tackling is almost gone, but Dublin brought it. And, and you know, there are people in there that love contact as well. Like Johnny Cooper loves it. You know, Small loves it. You know, uh, James McCarthy loves it. They love making tackles, but they did make tackles as well. Let's be honest. Like, you know, they, they, hit, they hit, they hit hard, they hit fair, and the ball popped out. And so... Um, so, you know, if you're going to play man-to-man football which plus, with the plus one at the back, if you're going to play that and you expect to beat the other team, then you've got to be better than them. You know, if, if I'm playing wing half forward and I've got phenomenal pace and you don't have phenomenal pace and I drop my shoulder and I go and then I go the other direction, it's over. You know, it's a foot race. And if the cover's not there and the support's not there, you know, and um, and so I find it interesting, you know, that that... Mayo, even though they've lost all those All-Ireland finals, 
never made that even adjustment to go for something else for 20 minutes back to your principles go again 15 minutes could manage the game in the last 15 you know they had a couple of all Ireland's won but they kept on sticking with the the other part of it um and yet yeah, Dublin who uh when the game was in the melting pot uh they, they grabbed everybody by the neck and pulled them to the ground on the most important kick out in the game because they knew what to do to win the game mm-hmm. and and Donny Gall now are, are absolutely gung-ho uh offensive um, Tyrone are looking to do it Mayo are still doing it Kerry are doing it um, but the other side of it uh, you know is about is it, it's about getting that right as well and I'm not talking here that it needs to be a defensive approach it needs to be both you know we tried to win the All-Ireland 2011 we couldn't win it because we were too defensive and not offensive enough mm. um, and we moved from you know like let's be honest we kept teams on average to 8.5 points in the championship that year, which is the lowest in the history Incredible. of the game. But that was our building block. That was our platform. And then we and we only got 11 scores on the board on average ourselves in every one of those championship games. But the following year when we won it, we were getting 17.5 points on the board, but we retained the defensive aspect. And there's a st- very strong parallel between that and what Dublin are doing at the moment. Dublin have men that want to defend and can defend and assist them to defend in each each third of the park. And then they have a phenomenal attacking unit with the goalkeeper, particularly the halfbacks, the midfielders, and the six slash ten forwards that they can use on a given day. So the balance is right with Dublin. Whereas I'm not sure if it is, you know, with the pretenders. I'm not sure if it is with Donegal or Mayo or Kerry. Um, uh, you know, Tyrone, um, you could throw into the mix there as well. So, so I find it interesting, you know, um, that people are following Dublin on the one hand, but they're missing out, I think, on, on that other part of it. And Dublin have all the boxes ticked now. Jim, can I just ask you, um, on, on a separate note, I guess, like we had the news in the last week or so of uh, Naomi Osaka, uh, the tennis player, deciding to, to not speak to the press around the French Open and then pulling out of the tournament um, as a result. And look, there are obvious mental health concerns there. And mm. for her, it was clearly the right decision. But it, it kind of just got me thinking about uh, GA players and managers and speaking to the media, uh, you know, at the height of the championship when when everything is at its peak. Um, and, you know, we've had we have different phrases like control the controllables and you have Peter Keane coming out after his Kerry side, demolished Galway saying, ah, sure, all the, all the usual Yera stuff. But... Uh, and then you see people like Jack McCaffrey coming out and being so uh, eloquent when he speaks. Um, like, in your mind, I guess, is it right that, that you know, GA players and managers kind of keep quiet at the height of the championship? Or do you think for the sport itself and for our national game that it might be, it might actually be a good thing for them to open up and speak a little bit more, uh, I guess, to, to you know, improve aware, awareness around the game globally? Yeah, when you say speak you sp- about mental health. No, sorry. That was just, I guess, Naomi Osaka's reasons for, for, I guess, not taking part in press conferences at the height of a tournament. But I just yeah, wanted but, to bring that part even that, to GA. Even that example of, of Naomi, like, you know what I mean? Everybody speaks about mental health and everybody speaks about the importance of mental health. But then there was a girl clearly uh, evoking that right and then getting criticised for that. Uh, and so that would be the parallel that I would draw from that, that every manager has that right. Do you know what I mean? They have that right to decide themselves what they should say and, and what they shouldn't say. And my take on it was that I was always trying, I was always open with the media. Um, and I always tried to give, you know, honest accounts. And um, and sometimes as well, like, you know, when you're open with the media, you're actually talking to your own players. You know, you're talking in terms in the, in the context of performance. Like, we know we're better than that. We know we can do better than this. We know we're better, better than that. And, and, and you're sending a message on the one hand, but on the other hand, the intricate details behind that message, the players are very, very acutely aware of. So my take on it always was, um, you know, just to be honest and to be open and and to say uh, what I I felt like saying or not, or not, you know, because sometimes it works the other way with media as well. Like I've, I've, I've been in press conferences, you know, with, 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 for, for big games and stuff and the media would set you up. You know, one guy will ask a question to lead the other guy to ask the question. So you, they're going to get you on the question that, that they want and all. So I think it's a two way street. Uh, and I think it's, you know, you can say, you know, people need to be more open and more transparent and more engaging if they don't feel that they can't trust people, you know, and, and there's, you know, there, it's probably a 50 50 split with myself because some of them just took the the negative football, puke football sort of jargon and and ran with that and and a lot of their stories were very negative towards us and then other people you could have just very 
common sense, good football conversations with them. And, and those are the, the journalists that you would connect with, like in terms of um, being more expressive and opening up yourself. Because if you feel you're going into an environment where regardless what you say, it's going to end up like I've done interviews since nine o'clock this morning. Um, and I've mentioned the issue about uh, Dublin being the best defensive team. That is going to be the strap line tomorrow morning. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Dublin are a negative team and Dublin are a defensive team will be what Jim McGinnis said about that, which is not the truth and it's not the case. But I know that half of the media will take that and run with that and the other half will be analytical and call it, as, as I said it, and and, and wait for that uh, tomorrow morning because I think that, that, that will happen. Um, and so... For me, it cuts both ways. And I think um, on all of these issues, whether it's mental health or just the right to talk or not talk, you hold that right. But on a personal level, I feel you should be engaging. I feel that, you know, the people at Donegal, when I was managing, deserve to hear what, what you were thinking. Um, and sometimes not, um, because maybe it's the betterment for the group or the county and, uh, as a whole. I have a look at this. Plenty more in that, and plenty more in everything else. I actually it brought to mind. I remember doing a post match interview with you up in Bally Buffet after a league match a number of years ago, and I think it was Neil McGee got the man of the match, and you were you were asking me off camera if we'd got the right McGee brother, uh, which uh, which was a good way to start off an interview with a, a, a fairly stern Jim McGuinness. I'll say uh, I'll say after that game too. But uh, listen, it's been a pleasure catching up with you. Whatever uh, the, the future holds, good luck with the punditry, obviously with Sky over the coming months, and uh, whatever the future holds. We'll keep a close eye on it and uh, our best of luck with it. Thanks very much, boys. Brilliant stuff from Jim McGuinness. You could really spend a lot more time in that man's company and you can hear a lot more from him on the telly as well over the course of the summer. He was obviously speaking as part of Sky's 2021 GA season launch announcing their uh, championship fixtures, 18 live matches, 12 of them exclusive to Sky Sports and uh, that was the former Donegal manager, Sky Sports pundit, uh, Jim McGuinness. You can, uh, if you come in halfway through, check out the full piece on YouTube a little bit later this morning. We're going to be talking uh, football in the company of Matt Holland next. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Dad Pod. Well, this is a video thing as well. You have a name. Podcast. Oh, midlife crisis. Howdy, Daddy. Mm. Midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Dadcast. That's not bad, actually. There was a, a definitely a period of a couple of months where meltdowns were becoming more frequent and now when she's outside and she's sort of playing with the neighbours kids like if she doesn't get her own way the meltdown is quite extreme so maybe that's the terrible news but I think maybe we've escaped the worst of it. Well I think the terrible news is a bit of a misnomer because it goes into the threes and fours Dadcast Tuesdays from 3pm on OTB Sports Radio tune in on the OTB Sports app Invisible Threads a Go Light original As we celebrate the sixth anniversary of marriage equality, Invisible Threads meets older members of the LGBTQ community who reflect on their journeys and tell their stories. From shame and isolation to conversion therapy, from living with fear to coming out as an older person, join me, James O'Hagan, for this powerful eight-part series, winner of the first Go Loud podship. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, nearly quarter past eight. Do keep your comments and questions coming into us in relation to the football, particularly because I'm delighted to say we are joined on the line now by Matt Holland. Morning, Matt. Good morning. Thanks, mate, for taking the call. We wanted to pick through the game last night, and so much as it was, I still can't, and I think many people can't figure out whether that was a decent step forward or if it's raised more questions about this team and, and the management team. Yeah, um, look, it's a win. I think that's the most important thing, particularly after the sort of start that Stephen Kenny's had in charge. Um, going 11 games without a victory, it was so important. No matter how it came, didn't have to be pretty. It wasn't pretty. Certainly for an hour, it wasn't pretty. Um, but the most important thing was, was to get that win under his belt. Um, I think he needed it, the staff needed it, the players needed it because, you know, you've, you, you know what it's like when you, things aren't going particularly well, confidence is shot to bits. Um, you need a little bit of, of something to go your way and, and obviously to get a win was the most important thing. That six minutes, was it after Andorra scored? I, it, there was definitely a moment there where you're thinking that Stephen Kenny and, and his management team might not even see the night out. It was that perilous. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, can only imagine what he was going through when that when that Valles goal went in. Um, you know, he, he must have been thinking, "Wow, that this is this is my time up." Um, but he, he had a he had a player in Troy Parrott that came to his rescue, and you know, in tough times, you need people to stand up and be counted. You need someone to to really lift those around them. And for someone the age of nineteen, I thought Troy Parrott, Parrott did exactly that. Um, First half, I felt he was too deep. I felt he kept coming to the ball, trying to get involved in the game um, on a pitch that was far from perfect. Let's get it right. And it wasn't easy for, mm. for the lads to, to move the ball nicely. But I just felt that he kept coming too short in that first period. The second period, and particularly after going a goal behind, he started to want to make things happen further up the pitch. And, and ultimately, he was he was the one, really, that, that, um, that dragged Ireland to the win last night. Yeah. And maybe give it away once as well. That uh, you, you, when that instinct maybe kicks in a little bit more of an experience at that level. Have you? He's been obviously spending the last couple of couple of months in, in League One at your old club, Matt. Have you seen much of him? Heard much about him? About him? Not not loads. Um, I mean, I've seen a few of the Ipswich games, um, and he's sort of been in and out the side a little bit. Um, I think. Uh, a lot of people sort of a bit unsure what necessarily is his best position as well. Yeah. Is, you know, is he, is he a number nine? Is he a number 10? Um, I actually liked him in that role last night. I liked him in that position. Um, I thought he, he um, it suits him. I think he's got that ability to come short and get on the ball. But don't come too short. Don't get in the way of, of Josh Cullen and, and Conor Harahan at times. And I think he did that. He, he, he was desperate to, to make an impact. Um, but sometimes, you know, by doing that, you're getting on top of each other. Um, but I think that number 10 position does suit him because he's got the ability to pick a pass, um, as we saw, actually, for the um, Ronan Curtis chance, because he was, he was you know, very unselfish, actually, where he could have gone for goal himself and, and just dragged it back into, into the path of, of Ronan Curtis. Um, so I think he's got that ability to pick a pass, but he's also got an eye for goal as well. Uh, Matt, good morning. Can I can I just ask you about Jason Knight? Um, uh, like another bright spark from last night's performance. If we're looking for bright sparks, um, and like Wayne Rooney was clearly a fan of what he did at Derby County last season and, and impressed quite uh, readily in the championship. But uh, he deserved the goal. He's a player, I'm sure, who has serious potential. Only twenty, uh, only turned twenty in February. I think he was a month old when you scored away at Andorra in uh, in March of '01. <laughs> Not to make you feel older or anything this morning, but like what what sort of a potential and, and and career do you think he can have with the Irish team? Yeah, I think you're right. I think I think the two major positives were were Troy and, and Jason. I, I like him. Um, you know, I think he's got a bit of character about. Him. I've talked about tough times. You need big characters, and he's got that. You can see it. He wants to take responsibility. Um, he wants to get on the ball. He's full of running, full of energy. Um, and, and you're right. He deserved he deserved his goal as as well. They were the two two bright sparks at the age of 19 and 20. Um, you know, you, and you're looking for someone to step up and be counted. Two young lads did that, and he's someone that that really impressed me. He can play in a number of positions. You know, he's, he, he, yes, he can play out wide, but he can play through the middle as well. No problem at all. He's got the energy to to go box to box, and so. I, I, he delivered a brilliant ball, didn't he, in the first half for for James Collins, which he, he should have scored. Um, so yeah, his performance um, was another, you know, bright spark. I think for for Stephen. We had uh, Stewie Byrne on, on the program last night, and, and he was talking about, uh, especially in the first half, the confusion among the players, uh, what appeared to be confusion. And he was saying, you know, the players look like they're thinking, "What am I really supposed to do here?" Uh, did you get that impression? And like, is eleven or twelve games enough, or perhaps more than enough, for players to uh, kind of bed in a, a manager's philosophy? Uh, is that confusion maybe among the players something that, that might worry you going forward? Well, I mean, Stephen talked about it before the game, said he, a lot of his his quicker players were ruled out and, and that he had to find a different way last night to try and win the game. Um, I felt in the first 15, 20 minutes, actually, that we went long too often. Um, and because Troy was coming deep, I thought James Collins at times got isolated high up the pitch. Um and, and so it didn't particularly work in the first sort of 20, 25 minutes. It was only in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes of that first period where we started to move the ball a bit quicker. We had a bit more concentrated possession, um, started to force them back, started to do things a little bit faster. Um, but I thought the first 20 minutes, we went long a bit too much. Um, and then it, and then we started to, to settle, I think. Um, but as I say, you know, that, that pitch wasn't easy. It was, it, you know, you could see it was kicking up. It was dry. It was a difficult surface. It, it wasn't easy to play football on it, and certainly not to a, to a high level. Um, 
I don't know, you have to be adaptable. You know, Stephen might have his principles, he might, you know, have his way of playing and what he wants to do. But regardless, you know, regarding the opposition, who you're coming up against, regarding the the, the, um, the pitch, the, the circumstances around it, you, you have to change and you have to adapt. You know, you might want to play 4-3-3. That's his preference. But at times, you know, we've seen already he's, he's played a back three, played sort of 4-2-3-1 last night. Um, so I think you have to be adaptable. Um, but I did think in the first 20 minutes we went a bit long too often. On Jason Knight there, um, Matt, what's his best position from what you've seen? Um, I'm not sure at the moment. I, I mean, I, mean, I liked him out on that right hand side because he doesn't stay there. And I think if you've got if you've got Matt Doherty behind you as well, someone who wants to get forward, um, then then he sort of narrows off at times. Let's Matt get forward as well on that right hand side. Um, but I think he can. But equally, he could play in midfield no problem at all because I think he's got that energy to, to do that and he's got the ability on the ball to do that as well. You know, sometimes. As a young lad, I think you get a bit more time in the wide positions, um, on the ball to, to see things. Um, in the middle of the pitch, things can happen quite quickly. But I think he, I think he has got the ability to play in there, no problem at all. Yeah, and like, is it a case that at that at that age, like he's playing at a good level, obviously? And Shane mentioned he's been really highly spoken about by his manager. Like, is it a case that you you get those sort of cockpit hours into your legs, and then maybe they're more easily transferable into being that? Like, we're crying out for people. Look, we've mentioned sort of Troy Parrott here. We're like, you know, um, let's not mention the the you know all time record goal scorer, but we're crying out for people to fill these key positions in the team. Is he somebody that you think down the track we can hang our hat on in that centre mid position? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to put too much pressure on someone too early, but the early signs I think are very encouraging. And um, I, you know, as I say, last night was a, was a, a game where you needed someone to to show that that character and that drive and determination. Um, and it can't, it, you know, it's not easy when things are going badly. I've been at the bottom of the league and, and you, you know, you're not winning games and it's difficult then to to take responsibility at times. You know, people maybe go hiding a little bit. You don't want the ball as much and um, y your confidence is shot. And last night, particularly after going a goal behind as well, you can imagine, you can only imagine what the players were, were going through. You know, you, all of a sudden you're sort of looking and thinking what the headline's going to be tomorrow, what people are going to be saying about this performance. And mm. um, that has to be that has to be put to the back of your mind and you need someone to stand up. And for someone, you know, two lads, 19 and 20, to do that, I thought was very impressive. Just when you mentioned there about the bit earlier, Matt, just about the mixing it up between the sort of playing it out from the fullbacks or or going along a little bit. John Giles was talking about something very similar on the show last night about maybe changing your philosophy to suit the players that you have at times, which doesn't necessarily seem like something that Stephen Kenny is that minded to do just yet. But would you tease that out a little bit more? But it's just that 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 um, I guess trying to get the best from the group that you have. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, obviously it's it's the World Cup qualifiers that the the, the most important at, at the moment. But he's had a he's had a week on the training ground, which will have helped, uh, I think, in trying to get that philosophy over to to the players. I know there's a lot of players missing, but there's you know, um, it's an opportunity always is for for some of the younger ones, and, and you know, a couple of them took it last night. Um, but he's had that week on the training ground, which would have helped in trying to get his message across to the players. Um, but he does have to be adaptable. You know, you can't, you can't just, you, you can't just um, win one way. You know, sometimes you have to do things differently, and you have to sort of pick people and and put people in positions that are going to get your result against certain opposition. So, um, you know, we'll see what what happens when when we take on Portugal next time in, in the in the qualifiers. But yes, yeah, certainly, I think you have to be adaptable um, and and change your philosophy at times regarding the situation. Uh, Matt, uh, again, Stuart Byrne was talking last night about um, maybe the need for a pivot player. Like I know we've spoken about players dropping quite deep to receive the ball. Cullen and Harahan um, seem to be in that position quite often last night. But do we need someone like Adlen Whelan who you know kind of fulfilled that role of, of a central pivot player? Is that something we're maybe missing in this team at the moment? Well, I mean, I, I thought actually, I, you know, I don't think he had his best game last night, but but Josh Cullen has got the ability to do that. He is someone that wants to get on the ball and wants to try and play. And I think he, he reads situations well. I think he fills holes. I think he's got a, a good sort of knowledge and, and uh, awareness of where to be on the pitch and in trying to break down the opposition at times. 
Um, so I think he has got that ability. I thought, you know, he, he, like I say, he didn't have his best game last night. He, his passing was a little bit off. And, um, but I think he's got that awareness and the ability to do it. Um, I mean, look, it's it's difficult. Again, it depends how he wants to play in midfield. Last night, it looked like it was as Josh and Connor together. Connor given a bit more license to get forward, and Troy just ahead of them. It might be that he just plays one and two number eights. It, you know that that midfield area will change at times. I think we need three in there though against against some of the better teams, obviously, because you know otherwise you get outnumbered and, and don't get the ball at all if you if you're playing against some of the best teams. Um, but it all depends again who you're coming up against, what the opposition is, and, and how they play. If they play a number ten, it might be that he just plays one holding midfield player, get around them, and then and two number eight. So it'd be interesting to see how he does it. I think Josh Cullen has got that ability, and I think he's had a decent season with with Anderlecht as well. He's got the I think the awareness to to play that position. As I say last night wasn't his best night, but I think I, 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 I like what I've seen from him so far. Uh, Matt, I'm curious just to, to get your opinion on, on, I guess, a barometer of success now. It's, it strikes me that next year is 20 years since we were at our last World Cup. Um, and, you know, you see teams like Scotland even taking part in this year's Euros next week. Um, and, and you kind of look on longingly at what could have been. But, you know, we talk about Stephen Kenny and the, the style of play and that quite often. And, and you know, some, some fans suggesting we need to give him a bit of time, let that bed in or whatever. But... What do you think the barometer of success should be for this uh, Irish team? Like, does Stephen Kenny need to get us to the next World Cup? Does he need to get us uh, to the next Euros? Is qualification for major tournaments the be-all and end-all, or is style of play also a, a factor? Well, I think I think you want to qualify for for major tournaments. That's the you know that's the sort of f first barometer. Um, yes, you want to play nice football, of course you do. But at the, at the same time, it, it's no good playing nice football and, and not getting anywhere with it, and not winning games, and, and not being successful, and not getting to tournaments. So, you know, I think the first and foremost, you have to qualify for the tournaments. As I said last night, didn't have to be pretty. We just had to win the game, and, and you know, it, it, so. I think that's the first thing. He's had a lot of problems to deal with, hasn't he? Let's be honest. I mean, you know, trying to replace Robbie Keane and, and trying to find goals in the team. Um, he's had backroom staff leaving. He had all the, the close contact stuff, you know, the, the, the COVID, he, he losing to Luxembourg. There's been lots of things go against him. Um, and he's, he's, you know, coming out fighting. He he's, uh, says he's, you know, he's, he's in it for the long haul. He says it's, this is going to be a team that we're going to be proud of. And um, I hope he's right. But ultimately, you're going to get judged on your results. It's like a goal, you know, a goal scorer gets judged on how many times he puts the ball in the back of the net. You know, you know he, might have, he might be brilliant every week. He get a nine out of 10, but he doesn't score. And all of a sudden, people are saying, well, well he plays up front, but he hasn't scored a goal all season. So it's it, it's got to be it's got to be results first. You know you can play as well as you like, but if you don't win games, then um, you, you know you're going to be judged very very harshly on that. So ultimately, it's about it's about winning games, and that's that's the be all and end all really. So qualifying for major tournaments, it's going to be difficult now, isn't it? After the the start that we've made. Mm. Do you think is there like I, I'm sure everybody and I'm sure Stephen himself and and Keith and I'm sure the staff will be saying, listen, this is the game, and they'll be telling all the players, this is the the turning point for us now. Do you think it is? Well, it's got it's got to be a springboard. It's got. I think he, I don't know whether it is or it isn't. We'll find out, won't we? I, I mean, you know, hungry on Tuesday, see how that game goes, and and you know, it's small blocks, small small little building blocks. Mm. You know, win a game, take it to the next one. Don't don't now back it up with a poor performance and a poor result. It's it's about building on what we've what, what we've just done in this game. Build on the positives. Look at the things that we could have done better. Set piece delivery wasn't wasn't particularly good. I thought against a team that actually are susceptible to set pieces. You know, I watched I watched Andorra's game against Hungary and, and you know I think they conceded two goals to headers and another one from a flick on. So they they um, they were a team that was susceptible to to set piece delivery and we didn't get that right. So there's things that can be improved all the time. You look at that, but it's about building on, on some of the positives from from this game and don't let it you know drop now against Hungary. It's important to back it up with another good result and a good performance. On the uh, the set pieces point on the Irish side, Stephen Kenny, we played a clip a bit earlier on where he was saying we didn't have a huge amount of time to work on the defensive set pieces bit that we had four days 
only three of those were work days and we were we chose to work on the creative stuff which is fair enough and I actually really admire the fact that he was so honest to come out and sort of address that in your experience of of uh, international camps Matt when you're coming in like that particularly into a brand new setup like that is it is it unusual that he would say that the defensive set pieces wasn't like a, an immediate work on that that were sort of hanging back to to work on the other stuff first or does that all make sense to you well I think I think he would have thought about the opposition he was coming up against as well and and thought right. that that Andorra perhaps aren't going to cause us too many problems and and maybe not have too many set pieces you know I think if you if you're thinking about it you know playing Andorra the likelihood is you're going to have more attacking set pieces than you are defending set pieces and and that was the case you know we had a lot of you know opportunities from from free kicks and corners actually um and I don't think the delivery was great um, so I think I think he, he, if he has if he has to prioritise and you're going into a game against Andorra, I can totally understand him prioritising the attacking set pieces above the, the above the defending ones. Yeah, it can be seen as uh, complacent or pragmatic, <laughs> depending on your point of view. <laughs> well, it, you know, we're looking at it in hindsight because we conceded one from a from a set piece. Yeah. So we're looking at it from that from that point of view. Um, if if people do their jobs, that, that you know. And, you know, just going to attack the ball, then that that doesn't happen anyway. Um, so I, I can I can certainly understand it from a from a point of view that against Andorra you're going to have more more in the attacking sense than the defending side. Uh, Matt, can I just ask you uh, about Patrick Bamford and he, he's someone who uh, Stephen Kenny spoke about and was asked about in, in press conferences in the build up to the game last night and. Uh, look, I'm not sure what uh, county uh, Patrick's grandparents are from, and he mightn't be as lucky as yourself to have a, a granny from County Monaghan, the greatest county in Ireland, here where I'm speaking to you from. But uh, like we all know, he played that under 18s game 10 years ago or 11 years ago for Ireland. Uh, Mick McCarthy made an approach for Patrick Bamford, never materialised. Are we at the stage now where the FBI should be doing everything in their power to, to try and convince him to come to, to Ireland, or do you think he's too close to getting into an England squad? Uh, in future to be to be a real, realistic possibility. Well, I, I I think that the player has to want to play. I think that's the sim that's the simple thing. Um, if he wants to play for Ireland, then he'll declare for Ireland, and and that's that's entirely up to up to him. Of course, you know Stephen will, will I'm sure have had conversations, and he, he you know he would have been doing what he can to to convince Patrick to come and play, um, but. I think it's down to the individual and down to the player. So if he doesn't want to come and play, then, you know, don't come and play. Simple as that. It's not going to benefit as if you've got a player who doesn't really want to be there. So I I personally am of the opinion that he has to really want to play. And, um, and clearly at the moment, that's not the case. Yeah, we'll watch that with interest. Matt, thanks, William. Pleasure. Thanks a lot, Matt Holland, uh, former Republic of Ireland midfielder on the line there to pick through the game last night. Uh, plenty of comments coming in. John Muckian on YouTube. Qualifying for a major tournament with the championship side would be impressive, he says. Uh, also comment on air. Um, there's a campaign within the media, particularly among ex-international pundits, to have Kenny sacked. It's embarrassing, to be honest. Well, I think if you've listened to the comments of Matt Holland over the last 20 minutes or thereabouts, I think that you couldn't really say that with any uh, with any degree of certainty. Plenty of other uh, comments coming in as well about how we should be realistic about where we're at. The majority of our players last night are playing at League, uh, League One, a uh, lower championship, and um, yeah, that is difficult. It is difficult to operate, obviously, when that's the quality of player that we have in and I think that's a fairly reasonable comment to make do keep your comments coming into us by the way we do uh, want to hear from you on the game last night looking ahead to Hungary anything else that's um, of interest to you this morning do keep those comments flying into us uh, this morning we've rugby to come and plenty more besides as well 8.34 it's Friday morning and I uh, hope all is well with you wherever it is you're at this morning let's um remind you that you're watching OTP AM first of all live in association with Gillette good mornings start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead now episode 4 of the brilliant the football pod with Paddy, and and, uh, Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran and Tommy now available to listen on podcasts you're going to get it uh, if you subscribe to OTP GEA uh, wherever it is you pick up your podcasts or if you search the football pod with Paddy and Andy uh, before picking their best 15 from the league so far the lads got talking about their own soccer careers in the in the soccer dressing room, I remember I, I 
So this only happened about twice, but I was called into the senior squad twice for Longford at the time I was there. And you had to come in a suit. You probably remember this from Monaghan, Paddy. You had to come in a suit. <laughs> yeah, I like here. Louis Kaufman. Randy Collins. I'm a tracksuit man. Like, I'm a track suit. Right? Yeah, I'm a tracksuit man all day long, right? So in your, this dressing room, like, it's full of dubs. And I, I go down to this shop in Longford. <laughs> I say, I need a suit. And they go, what you? I said, I need to play with the boys. So he said, they're all wearing this sock. I wear these grey slacks that could only be described as flares, right? Lovely. I, Sounds I wear, good. Wait till this, Paddy. Wait till this. I'm still more tired of it, but I wear a black shirt and I wear a white tie. <laughs> a white tie. I'm, ni- I'm 19 Jesus years of age. I'm, ni- I'm 19 years of age. Oh, right? good lord. And do you know Vinnie Perth that's it? Like, he wouldn't yes. remember me, but Vinnie Perth is captain of the team. There's a guy called Digger O'Brien there, two boys, and li- I literally walked into it and I just get murdered for half an hour mm. and I was sitting on the guy I was a crack lads it was brilliant for about three weeks it was nearly my introduction to the team the boys kind of half liked me afterwards because I looked so bad you know <laughs> black shirt and white tie oh is. bad oh, oh, classic. Yeah, but I, still, I, still, class. I still can't dress myself to be honest with you so <laughs> Paddy you're a good man for a suit tell us about Monaghan United what was that like down there you told us it was transfer deadline day signing one one year yeah I, I'd like I, d- I don't know if I've ever believed this did this really happen no it's true this is this is true yeah uh, I signed with the Rad squad in 2011 that summer uh, do you know like you hear I like, signed at the back of a smoke pack I w- was not far off that like I would have known Roddy since I was a kid like and uh, Roddy I, w- I would say is like the Irish Harry Redknapp just a character like players love you spend 30 seconds in Roddy's company I swear to you, you'll have enough material for, for a laugh for about six months. He's just, he's box office. He's real Dublin, old school, traditional kind of soccer guy. And he came across, and I was like, Roddy, I haven't played soccer since I was 13, 14, like seven or eight years ago. I'm, I'd be useless. Like, Don't worry about that, Pat. We, we'll find a position for you. And his whole attitude was like, it was funny, it was like his soccer attitude at the GAA. It was like, I'm sure you'll be fit. You'll have a horrendous touch, but we can put you like centre half and you'll be able to kick a few fellas. <laughs> and, and he wasn't far wrong in that. Uh, Shane Hannon, come on in. <laughs> Not the only one to fe- uh, featured in the Rod Squad. That was, uh, yeah, bringing back some memories there, Paddy Andrews' stories with Roddy Collins. Um, there, there were good times uh, that led into bad times for Monaghan United because I think Roddy took over in, in March of 2011, uh, got Monaghan United promoted to the League of Ireland Premier Division, and then, of course, in 2012, the financial difficulties came to a head. Monaghan United ex- essentially went out of existence in terms of a senior League of Ireland team. Uh, but yeah, the memories of Roddy, uh, I was probably uh, maybe 17 or 18 at that stage um, and kind of tipping around the Monaghan United under-19 team, of which Roddy Collins was also the manager. Uh, and I still remember one day in training, Roddy was obviously, understandably, struggling to remember everyone's names. Um and, you know, there's a lot of guys to remember, both in the senior panel and the under-19s. Um, and he called me over at one point to give me a bit of advice. And he said, what's your name, son? And I said, uh, Shane. And he said, you're not Shane, you're Ian Dowie. <laughs> and I remember thinking, Ian Dowie. And I knew who Ian Dowie, <laughs> Dowie was at that point, and it certainly wasn't a flattering comparison. So every time I got the ball, every time Roddy wanted to say something to me from that point on, he just called me Dowie. Um, which got a bit of a laugh from the other uh, from my other teammates. It was well, it was uh, your playing style, Shane. I'm sure it was nothing to do with the... <laughs> maybe, maybe. But like as Paddy Andrew said, there he's he's the Irish Harry Redknapp. He's mm. a character. He's someone who uh, you know there's never a dull moment. And like when you saw Roddy rolling up to Gordy Keegan uh, to the Monaghan United pitch for training for a match, there was just an aura, an aura about him that uh, that grabbed your attention. Now look, it was. It was a mildly successful time. I think his son, Roddy Collins Jr., was part of his, his team as well. There was a bit of nepotism there. Roddy was a good player, though. Uh, made his debut in the, the what was the EA Sports Cup under his dad. Um, but yeah, fond enough memories of Roddy Collins, you, except for the fact that I, I look like Ian Dowie, apparently. Were, were you Ian Dowie? Were you the big lad up front with his back to goal that would sort of make everybody else around him look good? I mean, Ian Dowie it, was, I was making like, everybody look good, obviously, but... In a playing sense. <laughs> yeah, like I was the tall striker. Um, but I, like in my head, I was only being called Dowie because of uh, what he saw as visual similarities between Oof. myself and Ian Dowie. Which, oh, that is harsh. You know, that's that's very like oh, that's very if someone harsh. wants to, to grab a side to side and, and, and send it on to me later. I'm not, um, I, I wouldn't be too happy to be compared to Ian Dowie. But look, I'm sure Ian Dowie's a lovely man and uh, he's aged quite gracefully. So. Uh, sure. Yeah, Roddy. I'm, Roddy, I'm sure had had worse nicknames for other people, so I can't really complain. 
We'll have to get Raddy on one time and ask him about uh, whether he remembers the Monaghan Ian Dowie. This is, a, <laughs> this is quite the development this morning. Um, right, it is coming up on 20 to 9. We've loads still to come. We're going to talk to Alan Quinlan in just a few minutes' time, um, including the news this morning that will bring you um, uh, rumours, at least anyway, on the back page of the examiner. So plenty to come. It is time for the papers. Do keep your comments coming into us. We're going to let you know what's happening. First of all, on otvsports.com. This is the very sad news about the former Arsenal and West Brom keeper, Alan Miller, who's passed away at just the age of 51. Also up on the website this morning, John Giles' thoughts. He was on for the full football show with Nathan last night. He has plenty of thoughts on the game last night um, and also picking his team of the year and uh, other bits and bobs as well. That's up there. Uh, Troy Parrott's reaction to the game last night and plenty more as well from the football yesterday evening. Now, on the back pages... Uh, the examiner I mentioned the story here it's the splash across the top Ryan said for coaching role with O'Gara at La Rochelle so Donica Ryan uh, Racing 92 player former Ireland second row former Munster second row obviously um, as well and uh, he could be off to La Rochelle to join the coaching ticket there just the age of 37 get Alan Quinlan's thoughts on that in just a few minutes time Rescue Act could be Kenny's turning point or stay of execution is the other uh, line there from uh, the examiner David Snade writing in my opinion people should be excited is a quote there from Troy Parrott uh, Parrott saves Ireland's blushes writes Gavin Comiskey in the Irish Times this morning as you can see a delighted uh, striker and manager on the uh, front page of the sports section there in the Times uh, Kenny relieved to notch first victory as Ireland manager and the player ratings along the side there as well uh, there's lots of puns on Troy Parrott's name this morning uh, none of, nobody has managed to go with who's a pretty boy then which is um, which is astonishing to me but Kenny gets buzz from Troy's story is one that you're going to hear a bit of in the next couple of minutes uh, Philip Quinn on that 4-1 win for Ireland last night uh, McGuinness Tyrone not good enough to win Sam writes Michael Clifford there uh, the Irish Independent Irish saviour Troy will only get better insists Kenny that photograph there again of the two of them being pretty delighted. Uh, Dubs the most defensive team in the game. For anybody who was watching our uh, chat with Jim again a bit earlier on, his prophecy that that would be the headline uh, has certainly come through uh, through this morning because it's on most of the back pages here. Uh, Perfect 10, the Irish Daily Star. Uh, Kenny Hale's two-goal hero, Parrot. Cash could tempt Conte, writes John Cross. And Dean aiming to rock and roll. That's uh, the news that Dean rock, as well as uh, Keenan Sullivan both hoping to get back for the dubs sometime very soon. In the Hurled, Troy will get better, says Kenny. Dublin, the most defensive team in the country, says Jim McGuinness there, as the uh, supplements fall out here. The Sun, now this is a good one. Buzz light here as Kenny gets his first win, thanks to Troy 2. Troy Story 2. Troy 2 Story. Troy Story 2. It's a good one. That's uh, Owen Kowser's thoughts inside there. And uh, Spurs lineup move for Conte. Uh, Troy, Troy again is the Murr. If at first uh, you don't succeed, Troy, Troy again. Uh, Parrot Brace helps save Irish blushes in the Pyrenees. And uh, the Guardian. Alexander Arnold uh, ruled out after tearing thigh muscle. That's the main news there. And an interesting one here as well, the England Wales Cricket Board to firm up social media uh, diligence after Twitter storm, including the line that uh, Ali Robinson, who is set for a punishment after the discovery of um, old and offensive and embarrassing tweets, as they're described here, uh, it says he's likely to be the last player to make his full international debut without anyone having sifted through historic social media posts in search of potential embarrassment. So it looks like that is going to be a thing from here on out in that uh, people are going to um, it's, it seems Shane like a wise and smart thing to do that's obviously in the the in the cricket like it's you know at what age do you go back to kids and go here you might make it as a professional sports people like ideally people aren't sending stuff that are that as I described here both uh, offensive and embarrassing um, and it happens and that's the unfortunate side of it but it does seem like a smart thing to do that uh, you know it probably happen at all levels of all sports you would think at some point soon Sorry say the, say the story again Adrian I So this, the, is, the this is just in relation to the um, England uh, cricketer Ali Robinson who's yeah. um, he's got to pick up some type of punishment TBC for tweets that have been described as offensive and embarrassing and they're going to know uh, it looks like he's going to be the last player certainly in terms of England cricket that's going to line out at international level who won't have had somebody in a back office 
sifting through all their tweets and social posts and uh, making sure it's, there's nothing in there of those of that variety. It is a strange one, and people kind of when they get to a certain level of. I guess, uh, fame, they need to maybe take a little dig back through their social media accounts. They probably shouldn't tweet uh, bad things uh, from the outset, but certainly if you get to a certain level of, of uh, uh, fame or notoriety, you need to you need to have a look over your social media accounts. I know that we had the incident, was it um, uh, Joe Hart or someone had the, the tweet? Well, it was Joe Hart so, you know, claiming someone from his account had sent a tweet um, after a match a couple of months ago. Like, players need to just take control of their social media. Uh, tweet yourself. Like we even have Roy Keane on Instagram at the moment, and I look. I don't know if Roy puts these posts up himself or if he gets someone to do it for mm. him. But uh, it's it's an area where I guess if players just take responsibility for it, if sports people take responsibility for their own output in social media, I mean they only have themselves to be responsible for. Then like uh, putting that on someone else is 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 quite a difficult thing to do. I would say. Yeah, so well, yeah, this this Robinson story certainly brings it into. To the, to the forefront, it does, I guess, again. And, and the difficulty is that even, I mean, I think when it gets to a point where it's clear that they're destined for the big time, that mm. probably most, not all, but most uh, kids <clears throat> growing up will, at that point, sort of obviously maybe be advised in the first instance and uh, in the second instance have enough cop on mm. to know not to do it. But it'll be the stuff that's cropped up before that that um, that is potentially there to uh, to to trip them up. I mean, as I said, ideally this stuff hasn't been sent begin with if it's uh, ticking both of those categories of being offensive and embarrassing um, other stuff that's cropping up across the pages today in the Times of London injury forces Trent to pull out of the Euros this is obviously a big story in English football uh, over the last 24 hours <clears throat> and it's just we're waiting now to see who's going to be called up in his place and all sorts of will they will they call up a like for like will they call up um, somebody like uh, Ollie Watkins or somebody in an entirely different position we'll see what Gareth Southgate which way he goes over the next while uh, England debate taking a knee writes Paul Joyce here it's also a theme that's picked up in the Telegraph this morning England could stop uh, taking the knee and it's an interesting co- nuanced conversation that I think there's always a right time to discuss it this is Jason Burton Ben Rumsby writing here Southgate to ask squad if they want to continue after fans boo calls for the FA to take action as fears grow of repeat at the Euros and maybe they're just two entirely different topics in that one, the actions that happened at Middlesbrough the other night are really unacceptable and they do need to be tackled head on and there needs to not be a repeat of that ever again but I do think Shane that a, a an open and honest and mature conversation about whether it's the right thing for sport and teams to continue to take the knee if it's still maintaining the symbolism that it had, if it's still getting the message through, is there another way of doing it? I don't think that it'd be it'd be terrible for the taking of the knee to follow the poppy route in that it just becomes something you have to do and the symbolism behind it and the reasons behind it become entirely lost. Yeah, and like again, this, this comes down to individual uh, decisions and Colin Kaepernick took the decision to take the knee. Similarly, Wilfred Zaha decided ultimately he didn't want to take the knee and that's... Uh, his individual decision, and you have to respect that. And um, when you when you hear the other the other day, uh, those boos ringing out across, around the stadium, um, and I think the commentator at the time, uh, you know, remarked at how loud the boos were. And luckily, they were drowned out by applause. You know, five or six seconds later, thankfully. But I mean, David Snade verbalised this quite eloquently with with Joe a few days ago on the show, and just speaking about the fact that taking the knee symbolises something that uh, most sane of mind human beings can get behind which is equality um, and anyone who, who boos at the, the, the prospect or the thought of equality uh, is someone essentially not worth speaking about and when David said that it struck a chord with me I'm sure it struck a chord with other people as well because that's exactly what, what you have to think about it, Like I remember the Bulgaria match as well when England went over there and you had the monkey chance and, and just racism left right and centre in, in the crowd um, and you feel like it's it's all too pertinent these days and you know, if we fail to to learn from our history and for, to learn from learn from our past, then I don't know where we're going to head. But uh, to, to look back in 10, 20 years' time and think that you know fans would actually so-called fans would actually boo something uh, as as nice as the taking the stand against racism and taking the knee, 
uh, shocking and abysmal and uh, you know abhorrent behaviour yeah and t- I totally take your point but I would say that we should talk about them and we should talk to them and we should try and understand it and we should try and figure a way out of it that way I think it's really the only way to get out of it it's um, <clears throat> as you say it's abhorrent behaviour and we just need to talk more about it actually I think but look at it mm. so, certainly take your point on it 10 to 9 on this Friday morning uh, rugby in just a moment but a reminder first of all that Let's Go Back To is a film and TV podcast you'll have heard about it during the week uh, here in the show it's from the Go Loud original network it's presented by off the ball duo uh, dynamic duo Owen Shane and uh, Sue Murphy special guests as well uh, with each episode who we'll take a look back at films or TV shows who uh, that we keep going back to over and over again and have uh, stood the test of time so this week's episode Jarlith Regan on the classic Ferris Bueller's Day Off episode 1 also available with Simon Delaney who talks about Glen Glary, Glengarry Glen Ross uh, well worth checking that one out uh, let's go back to from the Go Loud original network Time to Talk Rugby good morning Alan Quinlan morning Adrian how are you who are you texting who am I texting yeah you're in the middle of texting Tommy going here come on <laughs> get, to get enough of this plug-in podcast nonsense get on with it yeah no I texted that a few minutes ago no I'm <laughs> free and ready to go and all. Come here, the, the big story, a few bits to talk to you about, but there's a story in the back of the examiner this morning about Duncan Ryan and uh, strong links with La Rochelle and it reminded me that when we were talking to Ronan Agara a few weeks ago about the his own signing a new, the de- new deal, I put it to him that he might want to look at bringing in new cultures and he just burst out laughing and said that'd be something he'd come back to at a later time. This would be something that would make total sense. Yeah, it would. It'd be a great opportunity for Dunica as well, I think, um, to start his coaching career. Again, it's um, you're straight in at the deep end when you finish like that, and, and it suits some people. Ronan did that himself as, as a player. So, um, yeah, it would make sense. I think, look, the, uh, I, I've always chatted to, to Mike Prendergast and, um, and Ronan about the impact of Dunica since he went to Racing and the way he's, you know, would have been... It's kind of like a natural thing for some players with the way they're, you can see that natural transition for them to becoming coaches, the way they 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 run the line out or talk about the breakdown or talk about scrums and the way they can dominate and, and motivate players around them. And some players like to sit back and be told and guided. And uh, I think Donica would have, it, it wouldn't surprise me if he became a coach. I think from my time of playing him and knowing him so well, um, he was always a student of the game. He was always someone who was stuck in the videos, trying to learn all the time, doing extra stuff, always asking questions of, of coaches. Um, I think he was on a Munster under-18 East Munster team back in when I was playing with Munster, when I when I was starting out with Munster, and I was asked to go back to my to my local rugby club to, to do a session with the East Munster under 18 team and Donica Ryan was there. I remember his enthusiasm mm. um, for asking me questions about the lining at line out and wanting to learn. So I did this session with them and I remember going away thinking, geez, I got asked so many questions by this this gangly tall second row from from Nina and Tipperary. And um, I I was I was really impressed with him. And he was the same when he came into what, Monster. What was he asking you, Quinny? I mean, that's a very detailed Just question. General, general, general things about movement on the ground and and not just winning the ball. I think what impressed me for such a guy who's so young was defending the opposition. You know, because most people think line out is just all about attack, but there's so much com- complex stuff around how you defend the line out and how you watch what the opposition do and. He, he just was full of enthusiasm. Of course, all the other young lads were there, but it was just the confidence and the questions. And and you could just see this is a guy that's easily coachable, mm. uh, but also just has a real kind of desire to learn all the time. And uh, there's no guarantee that top players become top coaches. That doesn't always work. And it's the same. It's all across all sports. But I think it helps when you have a real kind of energy and enthusiasm to keep learning and that you're always studying the game and, and Dunica was like that he was always studying the game and trying to get better and then he became very good in the latter years of playing with Munster he would have been a little bit quieter obviously when you have Paul O'Connell and Dunica O'Callan as your mainstay second rows who were top class internationals and, and British and Irish lines and you know people who were performing at, at a high level and you know he's in the background and Mick O'Driscoll is there as well. So 
you know, he would have been quiet in the earlier years, but as he started to develop and get more confidence, you know, you're coming up against the Dunnick Ryan. We're doing sessions on a on a Tuesday morning and getting ready for a game at the weekend and starting that kind of line out rep and the preparation about what kind of line outs we're doing gonna do for the following weekend. And you know, Dunnick Ryan and Mick O'Driscoll are the two second rows going up against us and they're disrupting um our line out putting massive pressure on us and all that enthusiasm that I saw as an 18-year-old is now there as a big physical, big imposing second row and back row as well because he could play in the back row as well. And, you know, he always impressed me like that, Donica. So the point is, I think he impressed in, in Racing. Yeah. We've always had these conversations about, you know, what do Irish players bring to to the coaching setups as, as, as coaches and as players. And it's that bit of extra detail that sometimes is not... They don't pay huge heed to in France. You know, they play off the cuff. It's all about offloading out of the tackle. You know, for years we were saying there's no huge detail around breakdown, specific roles for people. And, you know, in Ireland we would have had very specific roles. Um, You know, look at Ireland under Joe Schmidt. Everybody knew what they were doing, when they were doing it, and it brought great success. So there is a need for that. Of course there is a need for off the cuff stuff. So... Dunnick's detail around line out and the way he'd view the rock and, and just general attitude uh, and work rate would have always impressed me because he was someone who pushed his body to the limit. So translating that in, in as a, over as a coach um, is different. Um, but I think he has the temperament, he has the knowledge, and obviously now he has the experience. He's 37, he's 47 caps for Ireland. Um, he was with Monster for a long, long time, and he, he's gone to France and been a big success. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think this is a, an unbelievably exciting move for him um, to link up with Rog as well. Makes it a little bit easier, um, and and good news for Irish rugby because you know the more coaches we have and develop, um, the better. So I think yeah. it's a great move. It, it, the, it was only just as you were saying that suddenly the Ronan Agar Paul O'Connell dream team looks less likely now. This is this is going to be the uh, this is going to be the, the new Martin and Roy Keane partnership. We'll see we'll see how it pans out. He, if, um, if it if it works, if it works, it works, you know. Yeah, because yeah. actually going to La Rochelle is is there's added pressure because of what they've achieved this year. Can they back it up? Um, can they improve? Can yeah. they get better? So you know when you're in the top or close to the top, it's it's difficult to maintain it. So Maybe they will get better, and you know they they've won more game um, to guarantee they need their way to Clermont tomorrow night. They secure a point there, and they're they're guaranteed a top two. Uh, Dunnick is racing their tours. You know they'll be trying to jump into that top two spot, but um, it'll be interesting. And I think there will be a lot of pressure there, a lot of scrutiny as well. But you know for Dunnick had gone there, I think Rog would have approached him and and spoke to him about it. And um, there's nothing done done or dusted around the jet but I hope it happens because I think it's it'd be a great opportunity and as as I said the more coaches we have um developing abroad the better and um but there will be a fair bit of pressure because Rog you know no matter who you are no matter how close you are to him I experienced that as a player he wants like if the delivery if Dunica took the job and the ha- his halfbacks are not getting top quality ball from line out or the breakdown is wrong Roger uh, read the riot act to him, you know. Yeah. So it's not as the case. It's going to be a nice, cosy partnership because both of them will be under pressure. I'd look, it'll be fascinating. It'll be brilliant for all the rest of us as well to watch on. The biggest question for him, obviously, now would be because it'd be a no-brainer if he was fully decided in his mind that he was retiring. But there's been obviously interest in Pro D two. He's 38 in December. There's probably still a question mark there of like you know if he calls it now, that's it done, and the temptation, I suppose, to do another year. What would you advise him? Oh, take this opportunity if it's there. Um, you know, it is it is a brilliant opportunity because obviously he will have the protection of, of Raj and um, if, he t- if he goes there and, you know, stability around that. And, uh, you know, you could go, he could go and play in Pro D2 and pick up a, an injury and things can change and you can get lost and these opportunities mightn't happen again. Um, so when these opportunities happen, you know, you've got to go from, I, I think he should go for it. I think, I think he'd be a great coach. I'd be, I'd be enthused genuinely. And I'm not just saying this cause I'd be friends with Dunnick and he's a tip man and I played with him, but I, 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 he's the kind of fellow who just brings an energy and a real enthusiasm around, um, you know, 
his presence and I think he would have learned a lot of Paul as well you know Paul has probably trained a lot of these guys around the line out over the years the way he had to learn himself um, I always tell Paul he learned from me about the line out he doesn't really give me any credit for that <laughs> but um, obviously you know Paul was a different level and you know he's he's um, you know doing well with Ireland now um, but things can change very quickly it's all results based no matter how good you are as a coach but I, I think Dunnick should take this um it's it's down to a personal choice, Adrian. You know, does he want to go into coach and does he want that pressure? Your day starts a little bit earlier as a coach and it finishes a bit later and uh, you're continuously watching and monitoring stuff and meetings about meetings about meetings. So it's different. You know, you have to have the desire for that. Yeah, I, do, I remember being sat beside him for a game against, it might have been the All Blacks at the Aviva a couple of years ago and he just chatted all the way through the game to the point at one stage he turned around and he said, do you, will, I, will I just stop talking? And obviously I was saying, and, and that's, keep, that's the way he is. He this just... is unbelievable stuff. He was he was picking, there was like an, overth- an All Blacks overthrow, if I remember rightly, at a line out and he, pick, he had a picked apart like that straight away afterwards could tell yeah. me exactly sort of to my untrained eye hadn't a clue what was going on but exactly why it came about what they were trying to get out of it incredible mind really what, in terms of his role um, Quinny what is it would be it seems like according to the examiner um, forwards and defence sort of thing yeah I spoke to Ronan earlier in the week and um, you know we didn't get into this but I know he was looking in the last couple of weeks that there's a couple of changes their forwards coach is gone John O'Gibbs is gone so I think he's he's in his mind he wants to be kind of manager uh, and then have assistant coaches uh, three assistant coaches and I mm-hmm. think so but obviously if, if Donny could come in he'd be an assistant coach but really with a view of, of running line out and, uh, and breakdown um, but I know the way he talks about it he doesn't want to pigeonhole someone into a specific role the way you have defence coach forwards coach backs yeah. coach all this kind of stuff the game is all encompassing now and, and that's the way he views it um, so like there'll be certain stuff that you know jo- that Dunnicker will take from Joe Schmidt um, which is is invaluable experience you know the stuff he would have learned from Joe the stuff he would have learned from Paul as a player different coaches in Munster um, Declan Kidney Tony McGahan um, he's coaches in France as well so you try and couple all that experience but and, and, and add to that and, and then you've got to manage players so look the reality is I think Dunnick what impressed me most about Dunnicker was the line out work that the way he improved particularly around those defensive pieces that we were doing mm. you know like me being gone Jesus these guys are wrecking our heads here because they're getting up, they're robbing our ball, they're stealing our lineouts here. And I just saw such an improvement in Dunnick over the years in, in, in his work defensively and, and have an ability to call a lineout. So, you know, there's always room to improve no matter who you have and how good you are. Week on week, you've got to keep evolving with lineouts and, you know, set a template around breakdown and bring some new ideas. So I think it's it's going to be, you know, if he gets involved, there, it'll be lineout and breakdown. Quinny, can I just ask you, um, there were some interesting tidbits out of David Nusifora during the week. Um, and look, he dropped a bit of a, a bit of a hint that maybe he will leave his position as IRFU High Performance Director uh, when that contract expires next season. Um, and I know his family relocated to back to Australia during the pandemic. But uh, d- different reports kind of suggesting maybe uh, the stage could be set for, for Joe Schmidt's uh, return in that guise. How do you see that as, as a potential option? Would, would Schmidt... I guess fit that role perfectly in your view. Um, yeah, well, look, he's he's um, Joe's someone who's incredibly intelligent and obviously has has, has was a brilliant coach. I think um, I I even though his role in world rugby now is more you know planning and structures and right across the board and in, in rugby throughout the world, I I think um, and I'm I'm not I'm only speculating here um, that that kind of d- desire and spark to be out in the, in the shorts running around like we, we saw him for years. Um, you know, even in the warm-ups, I, I was always watching out for Joe Schmidt running around, uh, being so actively involved in, 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 in the warm-ups before big internationals, where a lot of head coaches, you'd see him back with the arms folded 20, 30 yards away from the players and then the specific coaches doing the warm-ups and stuff like that. 
Um, I'd be amazed if Joe doesn't get back coaching in a couple of years. Um, I think that the the role he's in at the moment, um, you know, he's back in New Zealand. Um, he's back there with his son Luke, who's who's uh, obviously you know he's trying to protect him around from COVID and stuff like that. Um, still has the house in Dublin, so um, that link would be you know always be there, and Joe Schmidt will always be linked to to. Um, you know, if that role was available or even to come back as a head coach in a few years. So, uh, you know, he would have the credentials and the ability to do that job and and, and control all the, the forward planning and, and and planning around around the RFU. So it wouldn't surprise me. It's a job he could do very, very easily, Shane. But, um, you know, obviously he's in, in, a, in a role now where he's in a very high posi- top position in world rugby and, and running the game. So it depends how that goes. But, for me, I'd be amazed if Joe Schmidt isn't back with the shorts on in a couple of years. Just on David Nusifora's role, like he's been there for seven years now, and look, I'm not saying he's he's unaccountable, but you know he's heavily involved in in contracts and and uh, coaching appointments and strategic decisions. Um, in your view, that that job uh, is is it almost too powerful a job? Could it be split among you know a number of different people at the top of the IRFU or is that the way to do it that maybe one person kind of spearheads the whole thing is is it, it maybe too powerful is too strong a phrase but but what what's your kind of overview on 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 the role itself? well i i there is there is a um a games development committee and a game uh, in the IRFU that things have to be run run by um i think david nusafor obviously makes decisions and a lot of big decisions around the pathways and development of the game um, has had a, had criticism over the years. A lot of um, kudos as well, and a lot of compliments and and credit for for success. And particularly around the time, you know, the success from 2014 to 2018, we were probably the envy of 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 world rugby um, with the structures and and the provinces, the way they were running. Um, came in for a lot of criticism around player movement, I think particularly out of Leinster, which is understandable in a sense that uh, you can see both sides of the kind, you know, Joey Carberry move and he got blamed for that. Um, and other players moving around the provinces. But I think it's his job to try and make all the four provinces stronger and make the ultimately make the Irish team stronger and, and run the game here. Um, people would have liked to have seen more of David Nusifora. Um particularly around, you know, some of the press conferences and say that they don't see enough of him. But um, I, look, I think he's done a good job, but um, particularly around, you know, there's he has to contract all these players and make decisions. And I think in the last couple of years, there has been criticism there. So um, it's a role that I, 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 you, you, it's difficult to say you share the workload. You need a director of rugby. And that essentially, that's what, what it is right at the top you need someone who isn't afraid to make big decisions um some decisions that don't please people i think certain players over the years would have been disappointed that they didn't get contracts um some of the player movements stuff like that but i think you need someone and i think he's done a good job as i said a couple of years ago um you know he was getting massive credit i think there is issues um uh, and there's always going to be issues continually in a job like that. But um, it'll be interesting to see if he stays on. He was kind of hinting the other day that he may not. He may go back to Australia. And, um, you know, I suppose it's... I, I, I don't see the role changing um, because of... It depends what the provinces and what they feed back in as well. I think he's worked with all the coaches in all the provinces. Some of them maybe are frustrated that basically some of the decisions around signings and stuff is, is down to him and and they're restricted in what they can do. It's a totally different model here, Shane, from somewhere like France or the UK where they're individual owners and they can go and do it whatever they want, when they want. But, you know, the, the system here gets a huge amount of credit and then gets a certain amount of criticism, particularly when we don't perform in World Cups and stuff like that. And there's reviews done and there's feedback there about different changes that should happen. So... It'll be interesting to see what happens and whether he stays on and, and has the um, you know the stomach to go again or whether he's wanted by the RFU. Yeah, we'll watch it with close interest and plenty of stuff to say about the women's game as well that deserves coming back to at some point and we'll do that. But for now, Alan Quinlan, thanks a million. 
Cheers. Thanks, lads. Now, I think uh, we're going to look ahead to the weekend, Shane. What's on the menu? Nobody better to have with us this morning than to walk us through it. Yeah, loads, loads. Like, it's it's a big hurling weekend. I know a lot of people uh, are trying to get excited for the Allianz Hurling Leagues, but uh, we will have reporters. Taggy Fogarty's going to be at Kilkenny Leash on Sunday for us, and uh, James Skehill, the former Galway goalkeeper, has kind of found his uh, found his feet with the punditry as well this year. He's going to be at Galway Waterford, which is 3.45 on Sunday. Uh, pay-per-view as well, Kieran O'Reilly and uh, Cleana Foley uh, alongside Neil Tracy for that one. Uh, and loads more good stuff as well across the day on Sunday. And then on Saturday, we have uh, a nice Paddy Power Euros football special. Uh, panel David Myler and Richard Dunn are going to be joining John Duggan. And then the usual OTB football Saturday as well, uh, Adrian will be uh, uh, Shane Keegan alongside Dan McDonnell. And John Duggan will be sitting down with uh, Vera Powell, the Irish uh, Women's International Manager. So uh, loads of really good stuff across the weekend uh, on both Saturday and Sunday. So Saturday 1 to 5 and Sunday 1 to 7. Very good. And a reminder as well, by the way, over the course of today on OTB Sports Radio from 1 o'clock, OTB Gold will be uh, Catherine Switzer, that uh, Boston Marathon from 67. There'll be live Friday night racing as well with Ger and Johnny. Liam Coyle is the subject of the Team 33 Legend interview this week. And some OTB Gold continuing our athletics team uh, theme in the company of Ronnie Delaney. That's from 6 o'clock and, of course, off the ball on your radios and your uh, OTB Sports app. Download it now from your app store. It's the uh, best place to get all of our latest uh, breaking news and the podcast, best video stuff and uh, live content as well, including off the ball tonight from 7 and then uh, live Team 33 from 9 this evening. We're going to be bringing you Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran on the brilliant The Football Pod uh, very shortly, about 20 minutes thereabouts. But back after these with the Considine sisters, Eilish and Emer, in conversation with Shane. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. I signed with the Rod Squad in 2011, that summer. Uh, do you know, like, you hear, I signed in the back of the smoke pack. Roddy, I, w- I would say, is like the Irish heavy metal. We lost that championship game against Donegal. We didn't lose a game for seven years after that. I tell you, we were angry after that game. Dublin came back, I remember, in 2015. It was, we're putting this right. Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. At Online Tradesmen, we've never been busier. And if you're a trade professional, there's never been a better time to join us. Access over 17 million euro worth of jobs nationwide every month, along with e-learning and other supports. Need a website for your business? It's included in your membership. And on average, Online Tradesmen members get up to 10 times their fee back in new sales, marketing tools and savings. Apply today at onlinetradesmen.ie. Online Tradesmen, the home of qualified trade professionals. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. Have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Now, the Irish International, Munster Rugby and UL Bohemians player Emer Considine and her sister the AFLW player with Adelaide Crows, Ailish Considine, join us now as Aviva Ireland launches its hashtag Lace Up With Pride campaign. Uh, teaming up with Intersport Elveries, the campaign will give people the chance to buy rainbow laces for €4 Euro at selected stores and online at www.elveries.ie with all profits going to the LGBTI plus charity Belong to Youth Services. Imran Ailish, how are you getting on? Great, thanks for having us on. Good. Absolutely, absolute pleasure. Uh, Ailish, I have to start with you. Um, this concussion in Sydney back in February, uh, I know it was it was quite a scary moment, I'm sure, for yourself and for your family as well. And, and you know, just a few weeks after Breach Stack had, had her a horrific injury, your own teammate. But uh, what are your memories of, of, of that day now back in February? And, and I guess more importantly, how are, how are you now? Yeah, yeah. Um... Now I'm good, thank God. No, no side effects from from the injury, thank God. Um, I've been fortunate enough not to have had any um concussions in sport before, so it was probably my first major one. Um, to be honest, when people ask me about it, I'm like, I actually don't remember very much of the <laughs> the incident itself. 
Um, so it happened. Um, from looking back at the footage and stuff, because obviously people were telling me that it was quite a hard hit and stuff, but I literally was on the field for about 30 seconds in the third quarter and just got the ball, was running straight for goal, and that's all I can actually remember from, from the day. And I think um, I was I was knocked out, and um, I don't remember walking off the field. I don't remember getting checked with a doctor. I don't remember getting back to the sideline. And but I was awake, like I walked off the field, like I was actually talking to the to the coaches and to the to the physios and asking them questions and asking, them, can I go back on now? That this is what they were telling me after after the incident. And then I remember just sitting on, on the sideline and on the on the bench, and I remember just kind of coming back that like I was back, I could see, and I, it was the first memory that I had. And I had no idea where I was. I had no idea what I was doing there. And I was like trying to figure out where I was by looking at the sponsors on on the on the ground. And I remember just looking up and seeing that I was in in gear. So I was like, okay, I'm playing AFL. I'm in Sydney. I don't remember what I did this morning. I don't remember how I got here. I don't remember anything. And this was probably about forty five minutes later since the incident itself. Um, so like it was pretty scary not actually remembering what I did that day. And I actively tried to force myself to remember what I was doing and, and where I was and. And it wasn't until I got to the airport because we flew back that same night that I, you know, I started to piece together the the morning of that day and and you know before the game before the incident. But there's a 45 minute gap where I have no idea what I did, what I said, um, how I managed to get to the sideline. Someone asked me, did I get checked by the doctor? I was like, nope, didn't get a test, didn't get checked by the doctor. I clearly did. I got a concussion test by by the team doctor straight up straight off the field, but. I don't remember a single thing from it. So it, it's a pretty scary experience looking back on it. Yeah, terrifying. And like, am I right in saying you had uh, you had a, a freak accident not long before that involving a, was it a German Shepherd? Yeah, it was, it was actually after. So I had the concussion and then got eventually got back into training two weeks later and then had a solid week training and then ended up getting bitten by, by a dog at a random oval where, where, you know, I've ran plenty of times just randomly just came up and went straight from my hip and then got me to the ground and gave me a nice few puncture wounds and I've, I've a nice scar coming home with me now after it. <laughs> well, delighted you're okay now. At least at least you can laugh about it looking back now and it's it's all kind of done. But Emer, for you, like the time difference and, and distance, I guess, doesn't make it easy, you know, for family members uh, for something like that when, when the game's in Australia. But uh, you were in camp with the Irish rugby team um, when that, when that uh, concussion injury happened in the AFLW game for, with Ailish. But it must have been a scary call for you to get and, and, and even a match, I, I guess, if you were watching as well, to see your family member going through something like that. Yeah, so obviously it's in the middle of the night over there and I think Mam was actually watching it and she saw her go off. But I think the scary thing was that she didn't move for a few seconds and then get went in like 20 or 30 seconds where she just lay on the ground. And obviously I woke up then up in Dublin and I checked Twitter. The first thing I did was check Twitter to see the score of the game and then you just see Ailish Constantine taken off with an injury and you just always think the worst of what it is and luckily there's a really good app that you actually can watch back the the games with so I knew she got injured in third quarter so I went straight to the game watched it and then I like saw her concussion or saw her just hit and it was just like it was completely like I know the girl ended up getting a one match ban for it but it was completely like unintentional just a tackle clumsy clumsy tackle and the way she fell on her as well it just had the, the dual impact of both players landing on her head but it is scary, and I suppose it's so prevalent in Irish sport. There's so much talk around concussion in rugby, mm. and it probably wouldn't have been a main talking point in Gaelic in like football because even though I actually probably have had more concussions playing Gaelic football, there isn't the protocol around it. There isn't the talk around it. Obviously, the lads in the media, like the Welsh guys and Steve Thompson, like that's scary. The fact that they're so young and they have all these like early onset dementia and and um, these neurological diseases as a result of the impacts that they got throughout their rugby careers, and it is always at the back of your mind, especially. For man, you know, she's looking at us and I think with concussion, it's not visible. And that's the hard thing is, you know, you you don't have cuts and bruises. It's just, you know, in your head and you just don't feel right. And it's hard to explain until you actually get one of those head knocks. Yeah, it's terrifying. And like we all know in rugby, there are those big hits. And, and Eilish as well for you in, in the AFLW. I mean, you've had three seasons now, I guess, to kind of bed in. But, you know, those skills from GEA are certainly transferable uh, in, in many ways. But are you at the point now where, you know, the the, the Aussie rules skills are, are for you second nature? Or is it a case of, of always picking up little bits here and there still? You were famously Ireland's first ever AFLW champion a couple of years ago in 2019. But are you still at the point where you're, where you're, where you're picking up little tricks of the trade even three years in? 
Yeah, like still a little bit. Um, a lot of the major skills are coming pretty second nature at this stage um, because I, I've worked so hard to, to get them right and not have to think about them. But like, you're always going to pick up new things in games, see players do things that I wouldn't have seen before and try and replicate what they do. And I think, yeah, for the majority of the skills, I've, I've pretty much picked them up at this stage. But um, like you're, you're always learning. Every, every single game that you play, you always learn. But I think the major thing that, um, that I have to try and pick up and, and master is just the gameplay and, and the style of play that, that they play because it's completely different to Gaelic football and they play the game very, very differently. Um, so for me, it's just trying to master that side of things, the gameplay, the knowledge around it, the structures. Um, so that's probably the biggest challenge for me at the moment is you know trying to get my header and all of that and, and get that right on the day and be in the right position at the right time. And talk about getting your head around things. I, I'm struggling to get my head around the fact, Emer, that you only took up rugby in, in 2015 and, and like to see what you're doing now with the Irish team and with Munster uh, is quite incredible. But is it similar to, to Eilish in that, you know, when you took up uh, the sport of rugby, I know you had the background in camogie and, and Gaelic football as well with uh, with Clare, but was it was it difficult for you to bed into to this new sport when you took it up six years ago or, or was it just natural? No, it was hard. It was, it was again, similarly, it was the game understanding, obviously, like, no matter how long you're playing rugby or following rugby, the laws are always changing and the rook especially is always, you know, the contact element of the game is always, you know, evolving. Um, and that's, that was one thing that was really difficult at the start was just understanding the game. But, yeah, I suppose you're, you're like I've said it before, like, you're almost like a ready-made athlete coming from GA and it was just, I was so good at football and Kamongi easily and I was you know confident in what I did I was confident in my decisions and I was confident in the team environment but it was like flipping a switch and being the complete opposite person in rugby like I had no confidence I had no idea of the game I went from being the top of my game to the bottom of this game and I think psychologically it was really difficult because you're just learning all the time you're trying to take in so much information and obviously I was grateful that I got to learn everything at the top with the top coaches in the IRFU um, and I got taught everything the way they wanted me to learn in relation, like I didn't pick up bad habits because I literally got taught from the top coaches. Um, like I have plenty of bad habits, but you know, they did their best to try and try and teach me. But um, I think it was a psychological part of things that I was just learning all the time, trying to take it in, trying to take copious amounts of knowledge at such huge pace because I had so little time to learn a game. Um, and like sevens was so challenging it just but it did give me the fundamentals of rugby like if you can't pass in in sevens you know it's 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 so it's so it's so important in the game if you can't tackle in sevens it's so important so those skills been able to rook pass catch um tackle in sevens like it really brought my 15s game on and yeah I've never I never imagined it would it would work out like this I never imagined I pair rugby for Ireland didn't even know what sevens was before I played rugby um, and I definitely didn't think I'd be like sitting here how many years later still playing rugby and playing 15s rugby. I had read somewhere that uh, your older brother Keith had bought you before you ever took up rugby bought you a rugby for dummies book is that right? It was actually the first so I think I took up rugby in like October 2015 and then I was just doing like trainings like twice a week and then for Christmas that year Keith got me the rugby for dummies book and like I genuinely read it like and mum actually took it out for the day which she was clearing out and she's like I left the rugby for dummies book on your on your um, table but like yeah he actually did like I genuinely like I'll the funniest story I ever tell and I, I just cringe thinking back at it but when I went to my first ever tournament was over in San Diego playing against like USA Canada like mental that I went over there I never, never been playing a game before and Anthony Eddie told me to go nine and I was like, no, actually, I don't think it was that game. I think it might have been like one of the training sessions early on. He said, go nine. I could not comprehend how I could play nine when there were seven players on the field. Like, I could not comprehend it. <sighs> and like, to me now, as a rugby analyst and like someone who works on TG Gar and like doing an analysis, like, it's actually bizarre how I didn't know that nine was from half. But to me, as someone who genuinely like had no idea of rugby, and that just sums up how little I knew about the game. And he said go nine I was like but there's only seven players on the field and um, <laughs> that's how naive and how clueless I was about the game well look you've come you've come a long way since then Emer to be fair <laughs> we'll, we'll let you yeah. off with that one um, 
I just wanted to talk to you guys as well, briefly, I guess, about burnout. Um, and it's something that kind of comes up quite often. Um, and I know even for yourselves, Emer, the Rugby World Cup, Women's Rugby World Cup has been postponed until next year, but the, it's kind of been stretched in terms of days to give it a bit more time to breathe, I suppose, in the calendar. Uh, but, you know, I guess the importance of finding time for yourself and the important people in your lives, you know, you both, you know, between, I guess, work and, and you know, friends and family and all that sort of thing, uh, it can be difficult at times to find find the time. And uh, and I know a lot of sports people in Ireland and, and across the world, uh, that word burnout is so is so crucial for them. I, I guess for either of you, what 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 ways and methods would you say burnout uh, has been something that you've been able to get over as your careers have progressed? Yeah, I think it, it is definitely something that I find myself every so often just having to have a chat with myself or having a chat with Dean and going, you know, this is this opportunity has come up and it's it's like, God, do I have time for this? And when you actually sit down and plan it out and you just have to learn to say no to some things, I think. Mm. Um, you know, it's great to be pulled left, right, and center and wanted to do this and that, but so you just have to weigh it up and think, you know, do I have time for this? And and I, what I would have done in the past was try to people please and try and say yes to everything and every, you know, be everywhere at a certain time. And I think you just have to learn to say no to some things and just value the time that you have as your time like it's it's okay not to have like a full schedule or try and fill every weekend or every evening so I've learned through like obviously through failing at that before and um, when I was in the seventh it was really difficult with work training and it was just it was just constant and I wasn't enjoying anything that I was doing so I think when it comes to the point where you're not enjoying something you have to take a look at it and be like well why am I enjoying it and is it because everything else is too busy or because you know you like it, your time is your time and at the end of the day like Roby is it's not my job, it's my hobby and it should be enjoyable. And until it doesn't get enjoyed, while it's still enjoyable, I'll play as long as I can, as long as I'm able. Um, but I think I've learned that through, you know, being under pressure and having elements of burnout in the past. Absolutely. Uh, it's so important for, for you know, players to, to mind their mental health and stuff over, you know, I guess as a priority over training and matches as well, as you say. Um, for you then, Ilish, I mean, someone you're, someone who is clearly important in your both of your lives and your careers uh, and your sport is your, is your mum, Kay. And I know like we spoke about the distance between Haas and Ireland at the start, but um, I'm sure she's unbelievably proud of, of what you both have achieved. And, and look, I know you guys had to uh, both go through the tragic loss of your, of your dad uh, years ago, but uh, how much does it mean to you to see your mum's pride in what you've achieved and, and look I, I, she's I'm sure a hugely important figure in both of your lives yeah like she is she's not great at hiding how proud she is <laughs> <laughs> so she, she does she does let us know and everyone, time to time. And everyone else and everyone else from time to time so and no in fairness like we, we wouldn't be where we are today without it without her like she has she has been a rock um, in terms of you know everything that we've gone through in our lives and like we wouldn't be where we are today in our sporting career without her because I think she travelled every road in Ireland bringing us to either trainings or games or even two or three training sessions in the one day between under 14, 16, minors, Claire, Kinnaley, Kilmahal, between them all. I, I don't know how she kept, I don't know how she kept on the road and how she had so much time to, to pass with us. So she really sacrificed so much for us and, and I guess, um, I'm, I'm just grateful that we, that we do make her proud and it's, you know hopefully we are making her proud and give back a little bit for what she she did sacrifice for us as as kids and teenagers so um you know you got any more to say on her yeah i just think like she as an adult now who has to you know do your own washing do your own <laughs> food and live like you know life normal life like when you actually think of what she did so uh, there wasn't enough hours in the day like I don't have enough hours in the day to do stuff for myself not to talk about trying to do two others and try and accommodate like your two daughters going to x y and z training sessions and she, oh, like we were playing every instrument under the sun as well like it wasn't just sport we were it was piano guitar fiddle like we had, we had it all like I, there wasn't an evening we were idle so and um, I think our busyness and our ability to be able to juggle stuff comes from years of practice of trying to juggle everything um, on top of like being in school and everything so yeah we're extremely grateful and yeah she knows it as well absolutely i'm sure she does uh, just to finish, finish up guys uh, like what's next for you both i know Ailish, you've got your 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 killing out in oz there at the moment so uh, what what's what's in the pipeline for you the coming uh, months and years like is the plan to stay out in oz is it to come home and play some more club at some stage or what what do you have in your in your head at the moment 
yeah for the for the moment while i'm while i'm fit and able and, and able to continue and while they keep reciting me i'm gonna keep going out to australia and, and play for as long as possible i feel like because i've taken it up so late like only in the last three years that it would be i wouldn't feel right about giving it up now at the stage like i like i'm in it for the long haul i really want to go and actually properly give it a go and, and play for the next couple of years while I'm, while i'm still able so if that opportunity allows me to do that that's something that i will definitely pursue but i'm never ruling out the fact of coming back playing daily football at some stage that's obviously in the pipeline probably a good bit in the future right now but um yeah for, for now and for the next couple of years the plan is to continue playing australian rules football out in australia and enjoy the sunshine <laughs> exactly enjoy <laughs> the sunshine <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like for you, Emer, I know uh, it's it's impossible to have any sympathy for a teacher uh, heading into the summer months. I know you're a PE and Irish teacher. <laughs> you've got the next you've got the next few months to to unwind and do absolutely nothing. I'm sure. Well, I'm actually getting married in July. So that's well, kind of moment. That's why she came home. She was new. Well, new congratulations! Home. That's something to look forward to. Yeah, great. Like, I obviously really delighted, and obviously, we're going to have 50 people at it now. So, that's really um, relieving, to be honest. But we're back in season again in two weeks' time. So, we had a lovely off season there, well needed after a kind of mad year, just constantly training. Um, and then we'll be back in and full steam ahead for the World Cup qualifiers in September. So, really exciting that, you know, we have that opportunity. The World Cup has been on our horizon since, you know, we didn't qualify in 2017. So we are hopefully going to get to play those games and hopefully we'll know by September if we have qualified for New Zealand or not. Absolutely. Well, listen, guys, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both. And uh, I should mention as well, just what I mentioned at the start, but uh, you're both on with us because Aviva Ireland are launching its Lace Up With Pride campaign, teaming up with Intersport Elveries. The campaign will give people the chance to buy rainbow laces for €4 Euro at selected stores and online at elveries.ie with all profits going to the LGBTI plus charity belong to youth services. So uh, listen, Eamor and Eilish, keep doing what you're doing and no doubt we'll speak to you both very uh, very soon again, no doubt. So thanks a million. Cheers, thanks for being here. Lovely chat with Eilish and Emer there with Shane and uh, you can check out that full piece up on our YouTube channel. A really uh, thorough uh, chat I've touched on loads of bases, uh, loads of bases. If you missed anything, by the way, on this morning's show, you can catch it all back on the OTBM podcast or if you're subscribed to the individual feeds, you'll get them there. Uh, Matt Holland is in OTB football. You get Alan Quinlan in OTB rugby. Jim McGuinness is in OTB GEA, although it does, to be fair, touch on uh, loads of different bits and bobs. OTB AM live every morning in uh, association with Gillette good mornings start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead and Shane you've got a fairly busy uh, weekend to, to tackle ahead of you yeah very very busy weekend loads of GEA updates as well later in the, the, uh, the small matter of Monaghan Galway is until the weekend after though so that's where I get really excited but yeah uh, loads of good stuff as I said Damien Delaney and uh, or Damien Delaney's on at the week- weekend on Sunday uh, and then we have David Myler and Richard Dunn on Saturday. So plenty of Euros uh, preview as well. So uh, loads to look forward to Saturday from one and Sunday from one. Good man. And you're on next Tuesday as well, I think. Tuesday morning, bright yeah. and early with Owen. So uh, after the, the busy bank holiday, hopefully we get a bit of weather for the bank holiday as well. So uh, Listen, something to look always, forward to. It's always sunny in uh, Monaghan, isn't that the, <laughs> that the expression? Maybe. That's, that's, <laughs> that, I'm going to go with that one, actually. That's what I'm going to run with. Good man. Enjoy the weekend. Thanks, William Shane. Uh, Top work this morning, Shane Hannon there. And uh, right now we're going to bring you a segment from episode four of the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore. And here they are on the crossover between soccer and Gaelic football at the minute. And what Philly McMahon can bring to the Bowes dressing room. Philly McMahon is joined Bohemians Football Club as a performance coach. Um, Paddy, a teammate of yours, what do you think Philly would bring to the dressing room of Bohemians? Um, yeah, I, I, I was interested to see it. Obviously, I know that their season has kind of kicked off already in the middle of it. So I think it, it always catches the eye when it's someone from a different sport steps into that that side of things as well. So, look, Philly's had an amazing career off the pitch in terms of his strength and conditioning and, and the studies he's done and obviously runs his own gym, similar to, to what Andy's doing as well. So it is an interesting one. And the biggest thing I would say for, for any coach going into to a new dressing room. And this is true of any sport, you know, with a GA dressing room and there's 35 lads there, or Philly going into a Bowes dressing room and there's slightly less with soccer, maybe 20, 25 players. The first thing you have to overcome is, I call it like the credibility test that you're going in there. Before you can get get into your, your nut, nuts and bolts and how you're going to help the team, 
you need to go in there and show them kind of what you're about. And the big benefit for Philly is that he has such a high profile, even if there's 20 guys there to play with Bose and they're not GA supporters and they don't really follow Philly's career or anything like that, they'll know of the Dublin football team. They live here in the city. They train over in DCU. Like I say, they'll be aware of this really successful team that he's been a part of. They might be even be aware of Philly's profile outside of that, a lot of the kind of charity work he does and success he's had away from the pitch. So, so that gives Philly a leg up that, that, that straight away he can go in there and the guys are going to be like, right, we're kind of interested. This guy is from a really high-performing, successful sports team. And, and even though it's a different sport, they're going to be their interest is going to be perked of that. And that's that's a big thing for any coach going into a new dressing room because I've seen it with Dublin and as humble as guys are and as nice a group of lads as they are, when a coach comes in, you'll you'll give out, you'll talk about, you make a first impression straight off the bat. And, and if that isn't a good impression, um the coach is kind of fighting an uphill struggle straight from the get-go. And the football dressing rooms are ruthless. <laughs> We've had guys come into us with Dublin. And it's like, this just hasn't worked from the get-go. It's like, this it's not a good fit. Um, and, and that's probably harsh because the guy, the coach has come in and he hasn't even got to, to get down and get into really into the nuts and bolts of what he does. But that's the benefit that Philly has. He probably has a really high credibility with those guys already. And then the second thing then, and this is the most fundamental thing for any coach or performance analyst or anything like that, is he going to make the players better? That's, that's your bottom job as a coach. You can get caught up in tactics and all the fancy stuff. Your role is to make the players you're coaching better. And what Philly can do, I doubt he's going to be going in talking about tactics or, or technical skills because that's not his background at soccer. But if you're a Bohemians player and you go to him, well, you can definitely talk to him about preparation, dealing with pressure, high performance, you know, playing in big matches and things like that. Even though it's a different sport, like the bottom line with elite sport, it's competition. And you got to go out and you got to beat the other guy. So that doesn't change whether it's in tennis, it's basketball, rugby, it's soccer, GAA. You've got to compete and be mentally prepared to beat the other, your opposition. And Philly obviously has an amazing experience of doing that over years. So, so in things like that, I think you'll add huge value to, to Bose and, and to their players. But look, I'd be surprised if he's talking about the offside trap and, and the technical side of things. But he... no, it, it's a great appointment, I'd say, and, and great for Philly as well, obviously. Yeah. Did Philly talk much in the dressing room? Uh, he would have, yeah. Yeah, he definitely would have. <laughs> he would have talked to the dressing room, would have spoke on the pitch as well. Um, but he, he like he's he's such an amazing background and a story, and it's just his character as well. Like um he would have spoke very much so. <laughs> I'll tell you funny thing, like we're talking about man on man defenders nowadays. Philly <laughs> never wanted to do that. <laughs> Philly was the lad calling for everyone to get back. Philly is calling for Bernard Logan to come back and defend. And we're looking back and we're going, No, pal, you're you're on your own back there. Um so, so things like that, that's kind of... He never said uh, Anthony to the opposition. Yeah, and he never spoke to Andy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, Andy and Aiden O'Shea could probably tell you more about it. But no, he, he would have been he would have been a big leader, obviously. You, you can see that in his yeah. persona and things like that. So that's the type of thing Bowes would be getting. Um, and, and like I say, it, it can always, it's interesting when someone from a different sport tries to cross over. Mm. But there's so much, what you're dealing with is elite sport and, and competition and... And Philly has a huge background in that and being successful in that. So, of course, you can add value to, to players in that regard. Andy, I'm waiting for you. No, no, I just... I'm, I'm, <laughs> he's playing his tongue there. No, I'm, I'm just thinking it, it, it's an amazing crossover. I think he's, I, I think it's brilliant. Um, I love to see it. Um, and I love to... What I think the, the, the key skill, and Paddy has nailed it, is the Weidegger, we know Neil Fitzpatrick from sports, and she came in with us in um, 2017 and immediately... She caught the attention of the group. Do you know, it was just one of those ones, Paddy, that kind of just fitted the group perfectly. It's, it's, but, but we've had the opposite. Where it's unbelievable, isn't yeah, it? And you, you kind of know it straight. Like sometimes some people just have the skill, and sometimes they just fit in with the group really nicely. Um, yeah. And, and that happens. And and but I, I do like the crossover. I think the most important thing about the crossover, if I was thinking about it, is that you absolutely know your place and you know your role within it. So if Philly's going in as a performance coach or a psychologist or an s &C, whatever he's going in as, then he knows that role straight away. And as, uh, I think where it gets crossed, what I've seen in Gaelic football over the time, is someone comes in as an s &C coach and they'll be talking to you how to play corner forward and you're looking at them. 100%. Yeah. Get, get, get out. So he won't be going in there talking about offside traps or anything like that. He'll be going in doing his specific role. And within that, I think Anton that he's probably done 
in his career so far. He's probably mm. high achieved that. So um, fair play to him. I think it's exciting. It, it, it's it's so funny you say that, Andy. Tell me this this kind of goes across the board with, with GA. We we would experience a lot with, with Dublin. People come in and they might be like a guest speaker and like a motivational talk and things like that. And so we had would have had people in over the years who were brilliant sports people, like quite high profile sports people. And you're thinking, this is going to be class. I'd love to kind of get get a bit of background in this. And it, and, it, and it wasn't. It mightn't have been as good as you thought it would have yep. been. And it's just, sometimes it just doesn't work. And then we had some, like Jim Gavin was great for this. Like he'd bring people in completely off the wall. You'd be going, where is he going with this? Like we would have had musicians or comedians or something like that come in to us and talk to us. And they talk about pressure and performance and stuff. Nothing to do with GA, nothing to do with even sport. And they were amazing. Like, and you you were going and you're sitting there and they go, this is who's coming in to talk to us. And you're going, what? where in God's name is he going with this? Yeah. And they were brilliant. So, so it's just, it's amazing. You get to see both sides of it. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to the personality. And a lot of it just comes down to the, their actual experiences. Where, and it's not going to be specific. Like someone coming in talking to us, they haven't won all Ireland or played in all Ireland finals. But that doesn't matter. But they've performed under pressure. And they've... Anyone stand out, Paddy? Well, we, we, we had a good couple, yeah. Like, like we would have had kind of a couple of musicians, definitely, who we thought they were going to come in and just play a few tunes and it would have been great, but they were actually amazing outside of that. Um, we, no, we had a couple of interesting ones. We always said we wouldn't say who they were. Okay, but, uh, that's fair. That's uh, fair. But it's just funny what Andy says, because it's so common. It, it is that yeah. you get some guys and it just, it just doesn't work for whatever reason, you know? And then, like I say, on the other side of things, you could have someone coming in and just... It clicks. They're brilliant. It's just a, a link. So that's what Philly's obviously going to be trying to do over there uh, with Bose. He has the experience and the knowledge and stuff. Like I say, as Andy said, he's 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 a high achiever anyway. So so I'm sure he'll be able to rub off on some of those guys. Yeah, I think the 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 big big thing about fellas like Philly and physios and strength and conditioning coaches and all these guys, if you think about it, they probably spend more time with players than anybody else in the group. Because an SNC mm. coach. They're in the gym with you. It's probably one on one, or it's you know one on six, or you know you have a group with you. You would never have thirty with you. Physio, you're half an hour lying on a bed if you can get it. You know, and the, the, so <laughs> they're basically you're telling them your problems like with everything, and they're just listening. So mm. if if you go in there with a real open, like I think you need to be really guarded not to be giving your own opinions, but you have to be a really good listener on on top of it. And I think mm. if you have that, I think you're 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 halfway there. Does a it- what about the culture of a soccer dressing room? Do they hold the GA in high enough stock? You've both kind of been in, in and around it. Andy, you were telling the story last week of telling one of your teammates to go off and watch Kieran Mack and he was blown away by it. Um, yeah. Well, well, I think I, I think the, the, the stock question is a good question because where Philly comes from, Ballymun, again, I'm talking, uh, like, but I'm just listening to what Philly has said in the past about Ballymun and the troubles they had growing up and stuff like that. And an awful lot of soccer... Like it, like we know, like I lived in a council estate myself. We did nothing but play soccer, and this is where soccer has kind of grown from. So mm. Philly will know the troubles of an awful lot of these players and where they came from and what what they've done and how they've done so well to achieve to get to that position. So I think Philly McMahon will have no problem with a stock even away from the game. Never mind what he's done. Yeah, in, yeah. in the in the soccer dressing room, I remember I. I so this only happened about twice, but I was called into the senior squad twice for Longford the time I was there. And you had to come in a suit. You probably remember this from on hand, Paddy. You had to come in a suit. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Louis uh, Coffin. Ready, I'm, I, I'm a tracksuit man. Like, I'm a <laughs> tracksuit. Like. Yeah, I'm a tracksuit man all day long, right? So in your this dressing room, like it's full of dubs. And I, I go down to this shop and lunch. <laughs> I say, I need a suit. And they go, What you? I said, I need to play with the boys. So he said, They're all wearing this stuff. I wear these grey slacks that could only be described as flares, right? Lovely. Uh, Sounds I wear, good. Wait till this, Paddy. Wait till this. I'm still mortified about it. But I wear a black shirt and I wear a white tie. <laughs> a white tie. I'm, ni- I'm 19 Jesus years of age. I'm, ni- I'm 19 years of age. Oh, right? good Lord. And do you know Vinnie Perth that's it? Like, he wouldn't yes. remember me, but Vinnie Perth that's captain of the team. There's a guy called Digger O'Brien there. Two boys. And li- I literally walked into it and I just get murdered for half an hour mm. and I was sitting on the guy with a crack lads it was brilliant for about three weeks it was nearly my introduction to the team the boys kind of half liked me afterwards because I looked so bad you know <laughs> black shirt and white tie oh is. bad oh, top class I, yeah, but I, I, still, top I still class. can't dress myself to be honest with you so <laughs> Paddy you're a good man for a suit tell us about Monaghan United what was that like down there you told us it was transfer deadline day signing one 
one year. Yeah, I, I, I'd like. I, d- I don't know if I've ever believed this. Did this really happen? No, it's true. This is this is true. Yeah, uh, I signed with the Rad Squad in 2011 that summer. Uh, do you know what? Like you hear, I like, signed at the back of a smoke pack. I w- was not far off that. Like I would have known Roddy since I was a kid. Like, and uh, Roddy, I would I would say is like the Irish Harry Redknapp, just a character. Like players love you. Spend 30 seconds in Roddy's company. I swear to you, you'll have enough material for, for a laugh for about six months. He's just, he's box office. He's real Dublin, old school, traditional kind of soccer guy. And he came across and I was like, Roddy, listen, I haven't played soccer since I was 13, 14, like seven or eight years ago. I'm, I'll be useless. Like, Don't worry about that, Pat. We, we'll find a position for you. And his whole attitude was like, it was funny, it was like a soccer attitude of the GAA. It was like, I'm sure you'll be fit. You'll have a horrendous touch, but we can put you like centre half and you'll be able to kick a few fellas. <laughs> and, and he wasn't far wrong in that, but uh, but that was kind of the, the. It's funny back then, and and this has changed so much. That the attitude from soccer to GA was like that's for country people, um, GA. It's just kind of there's no skill, there's no tactics. They're all bad ball they call it in Dublin, like, and the same from from GA. We'd look at it and go, the soccer guys are all soft. They're all you know they've no they don't work hard. They no kind of. They don't have a hard mentality and things like that. But the change in that, over even over the last four or five years, the amount GAA, and we're talking about tactical innovation and stuff like that, and Andy touching on with kind of praising the Northern teams are always seem to be the forefront of, of innovations of the game. The amount GAA has learned from soccer over the last five, ten years in terms of tactics and things like that. I think that the, the old school, the stereotype of, the team's not getting on and soccer and GAA being separate. I think there, there, there's a healthy respect there now that soccer people can see, particularly in, in Dublin, with the success the Dublin team have had, kind of what a, a bit more understanding of what the GAA is about. And GAA people generally, younger generations definitely love soccer. We all follow soccer. It might have been an old school thing where, kind of a legacy thing where older people didn't, didn't the foreign game, they didn't mm. want to get involved in it. But, but the, the influence of soccer tactics on GAA now particularly over the last five or so years is huge and and it's been such a benefit to the game like yeah it's developed an unbelievable amount um and you know when we talk about the the gig impression that we've kind of spoken about mm. a few times not really um I know you don't really buy it Andy the the heavy heavy metal football is that is that what we uh, called uh, it in the I, I, paper I, did, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't buy the 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 way big JB was uh was was described. Because he just doesn't get on with Bradley. Like if someone I else know, said it. I actually, I actually, I, I actually do. To be honest, I actually the dubs, do. The dubs but, love Bradley, though, don't they, Paddy? But you're doing. Like, yeah, what? you love Bradley. Oh, do we? Okay. I thought you did. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe they yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, no, we actually, um, yeah, we actually get on it right. But it's, it's just I was reading it like <laughs> you're wrong. Like, but, but I, I do absolutely buy what Paddy was saying. The, the press and like you're looking at our map, not pressing the kick out at the minute. I don't buy you for one minute. That when it comes to the first round of the championship game, mm. that Donny isn't going to have them pushed on into the corner. Do you know that they're going to be really squeezing the kick out, kick it out to Jerry Oak Burns and Grimley mm. and these guys and let them jump for it. I don't, I don't buy that for a second. So I think the the press side of it is going to be huge. I think Dublin's huge advantage, and you, there is advantages there, but the advantage in football in terms was that the Jason Sherlock, who wasn't afraid to jump bring a bit of basketball into it, bring yeah. a bit of soccer into it, and that mix of stuff. Like, like, how do you do uh, basketball defence? You go full court press, you go zonal defence around your, around your key. Like, it, you know, and it, it's the same. It, it's it's unbelievable, Andy. If you, you look t- even 10 years ago, a keeper before Cluxton say, keeper kicks the ball out, it's out to the middle, two big lads compete. You're defending a kick out, the six forwards just go to their six positions. The change from that is from soccer and basketball. Like, Kerry used to play against us and they put four guys in the full forward line, they put four guys in their half forward line, and they have four guys across the middle. So they just completely pressed, blocked out the zones. That's like a, a soccer tactic in terms of like you're talking completely. about Klopp, Klopp, what he does with Liverpool, push up and try and set a trap for someone. They, they were trying to do that to get the better of Klucko. That was Basketball, 2019, was it? it? It's been going on for longer than that, but 2019 is when it was kind of obvious to, to everyone, but, but Kerry would have done that with us. Jim McGuinness famously caught us out with Dublin in 2014. We were playing just man on man. We were like, Total football, we're just going to attack. Jim McGuinness could see that. All of a sudden, they started dragging us out of positions. Uh, Big Neil Gallagher, m- uh, midfield, was suddenly playing full forward, and Michael Darren McCauley's playing full back, kind of looking around, going, What the hell? Is that? That's like soccer tactics in terms of moving opposition around. You look at Donegal, we touched on it in their first game against 
against Tyrone this year in the league when they beat them 18-16. The second half, Tyrone's defence all sit in the middle of the pitch. So Donegal are solo on the pitch. And Paddy McBrearty, uh, Karen Thompson, Michael Langer are all just standing in sidelines. That's a basketball tactic. That, that's, they're blocking the, the basket or the goal in Tyrone's case. So Donegal set up along the arcs and they're working the ball and McBrearty or Thompson kicks a brilliant score just coming off the loop. That would be unheard of in GAA 10 years ago because the GAA was so insular. I don't want to hear about soccer. That's soft. I don't want to hear about basketball. What are you talking about basketball for? But the open-mindedness and the kind of growth mindset of coaches all over the country. Dublin did it. We, we were fortunate. We had somebody like J.O. Who, who was amazing. Kerry with their kick-out tactics. Look at what Donny Gall are doing with McGuinness. Every county is adopting to this. Yeah. Whereas 20 years ago, soccer was forgettable. GAA was traditional. This is the way we're playing. And there are so many teams doing it. Even look, we're talking about shooting efficiency and shooting accuracy. Mm. Dublin worked the ball around the arc to the best shooter. Claire at the weekend. Colin Collins has cleared him. David Hubbardy is getting the ball. He's the shooter. Get the ball to the shooter. And that's from basketball. Like I read a great book after Kobe Bryant died. There was a book called Three Ring Circus about the LA Lakers. And like three-point shooting wasn't really a thing, but traditionally basketball was work the ball up to the basket, get a slam dunk. And all of a sudden, Michael Jordan and then Kobe Bryant come along, Steph Curry now. Three-point is all their age. And they're working. Their whole team is built around getting him the ball for three-pointers. And that was just a tactical innovation. And it's come into GAA now. Like, you're saying, why is shooting accuracy so high? Because teams are working the ball to the best shooter. Kerry get the ball to David Clifford. They literally hand him the ball. Yeah. Sean O'Shea could take shots if he wanted to. You can see it with the Clare and Cork came at the weekend. Clare have backs coming up the pitch, and they're looking around. And, and 10 years ago, they'd take the shot themselves. But it's tactics. Who's our shooter? Where do we get it to in the most advantageous position? We said about Donegal working the ball to McBrearty. This is all tactics from other sports. Coaches being more open-minded. Players coming to coaches going, I see this in soccer, I've seen this in basketball, I've seen this in rugby. There's so much to learn from other sports. And, and that's the big benefit that GAA has gone through over the last five, ten years. And there's a sacrifice to it, Paddy, because that famous game you mentioned, 2014, which mm. to me was the biggest change for ye, uh, because you. Oh, that's, that changed their whole yeah, philosophy. Yeah. Because you could always get a Dublin. You always knew there was a, a space in front of you. You always knew you were going to... Mm. You, know, the, the, you could get goals against them. But that changed everything. And what it did was there was huge sacrifice in it as well. Because if you remember the game, I think Conley hit four bombs. Flynn and hit four Flynn, bombs. Yeah. In the Eight first points half. in the first and half. And like, yeah. when you take that out of it, then you have to take that element of brilliance out of certain players. And that's hard for a coach to do. So you have to go to Jeremy Conley. I don't know how you do this or how you go about it. But you, you basically go, Jeremy... You're not allowed to take that shot, you know, or you, know, or you, you don't say you're not allowed, but you have to say, yeah. right, there's a better option here. That's a one in five, maybe, where we can work it in and it's three out of five. And, you, mm. you know, so there is change. But, but, you but, but you're right, Andy. And that took, and this is what we were talking about in our very first part, talking about new coaches coming in and trying to get, like, Tyrone have been used to playing a more conservative style. And now all of a sudden, Fergal Logan's coming in and saying to Ronan McAdoo, you got the ball on, on your own square. I want you to kick a 50 yard kick pass. I want to get the ball up to. And that's kind of, I haven't done that for years. And with Dublin, in James' first couple of years, 13, we won the All-Ireland, we won the league, we won everything playing this. It was like Harlow Globetrotters. We all loved it. It was like, <clears throat> we're going out and we're attacking from everywhere. And if teams want to go man to man, well, that's great. We'll take that. And the Duddy Gall just completely outsmarted us and got the better of us. And then we changed their tactics. And it did become, if you look at the Dublin team that won in James' first All-Ireland in 2013 to the one that won the five in a row in 2019, it's chalk and cheese, the style of play. It's far more controlled. It's not better or worse. It's just we became such a, a, a far more smarter team, I would say. And that was the coaches and the players buying into that. We would kept keep the ball a lot more, be a lot more patient. Um, some people might say that's not as exciting to watch or exciting to play, but we just wanted to be successful. Um, but that's tactical innovation. And, and that's really experience. And that's the challenge I'm saying for... for like Peter Keane last year, we go back to this, he tried to change his complete style of play in one match against Cork. Like that takes months and months and years and years to learn and perfect. And, you know what I mean? And they were completely caught out. It was alien to all the players. And that was the challenge for Dublin moving from that kind of free-flowing style of play. And we would have had so many conversations about, like, like I say, those shots that the guy scored, Flinner and Dermot Connolly, they're all, I think they were all outside the 45. They were, 50 yeah. Yards. yeah. It was, it was a, you can't rely on that consistently. 
So the, and now Dublin work the ball into the edge of the D and shoot from 30 yards. So it's, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing change to see. Like. Does that like that that you're 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 saying it can't happen overnight, but going from that whole Harlem Globetrotter style and those shots from outside the 45 to the 85% shooting efficiency. I know that's only a, a stat that we're throwing out from a couple of weeks ago, but you know how good they Dublin became at their shooting efficiency and their their decision making around shots. Is there anything that stands out, like a light bulb moment that clicked about okay, we, we've got to change the way we're doing this here? Um maybe not one particular thing, but it was just I hope say this the benefit we had was that we had depth in the forwards that if you didn't do it, you were gone. So, so, so that's the, the every player in any county, all they want to do is play. So if the coach is telling you to do something and you're Conor McManus from Monaghan, Conor McManus doesn't need to really adhere to that. He can shoot from anywhere because he's a brilliant player. He knows he's Monaghan's best forward and no one's really going to take his place. Um, same, like David Clifford, again, these are probably bad examples because they are brilliant forwards. Mm. But they could take these shots and it doesn't really matter. There, there's not going to be punishment if they miss it because they know how good and important they are to the team. With Dublin, it was, if I didn't do it and started taking these crazy shots, well, Jim would just turn and go, well, you're not playing. Um, Kevin McMenon was going to play instead or Arnold O'Gar or Dean Rock or Carmel Costello. So, so that was always the benefit that, that we had, mm. that, that that depth, if you didn't buy into it, you were gone anyway. So, so there's a bit of the players buying into it, but there's also the fear of just you do what the coach tells you or, or you're not going to play, you know? Yeah. Well, just going on to Paddy's point there and just to not re harping on the Miro Dublin thing, but we talked a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago in the pod and we were on about you know, the wins and the losses and stuff like that. It, it'd be fascinating, actually, Tommy, for you to go back and look at the 2017 final, even if you just type in the scores from it. I watched it back a half an hour ago. And look at the scores. Do you do anything else? No. Look look at the scores that were scored from Mayo that day. Yeah. Like, they were, like, they were Conley, Flynn, S. Yeah, Killian, Jason Doherty. Yeah. Yeah. A range of scores, yeah. They were, they were, they were, every score, was, there was no tap overs where you looked at Dublin scores. Now, and we, we talked about the last few minutes of the games where like you're getting tired, your decision making is down, and you're looking at where you're scoring from. And Dublin just kept scoring from the same spot. Where Mayo, with tired legs mm -hmm. and tired bodies, had to keep trying to score these worldies. And well, it just didn't yeah. happen. In the so 50, it's not sustainable, is it? It's not, you won't consistently yeah. get no. it. You might have a day where they go over from everywhere, yeah. I think, yeah. but it's not consistent and it's not yeah. sustainable success to do it that way. But, but the funny thing, I know we kind of got off piece with it, but that was. That's tactics from other sports and taking it into in, into the GAA, um, and it's just it's brilliant to see because it just makes the game better. And, and that kind of close mentality of that's their sport. You stick to that, stay in your lane. Be, like the best coaches are innovative. They they bring new ideas. The best players take that on board. How do I get better? Tell me anything. Give me mm. any insight for me to get better. Even the best guys, like like Cluxton's the obvious example. He's still trying to get better. How? What other sports can I look at to get better? Um, and, and you can see that across the GAA now. Some brilliant performances and, and brilliant coaches in putting that into the team. It takes time, and that's the challenge for, for the newer guys. And like a touch on Galway and, and, and Tyrone and places like that. But it's it's great to see. It, just on that 27 Neil Ireland final, there is a brilliant YouTube version of that game, which is just the shots. And it's about 28 minutes, the whole game, you know, broken down to that. But when you're talking about that, in the second half of that game, Dublin started taking Brian Fenton scores a, a point from 15 yards and I think Kevin Man Miniman scores a point closer into goals as well Lee Keegan scores that goal to send Mayo ahead and I think the next shot that Mayo have Aidan O'Shea is inches wide with a shot with the outside of his left foot from near the sideline Over and the, that nearly under the cues of and, and you're, you're underneath the post that day and it's so close it's so close but Dublin weren't taking those shots in the last no. 15 minutes no no um yeah, so I, like I don't know—is that legs? What is that? You know, like, you get me emotional now, Tommy. Andy was in flying form there, Tommy. You're after just like your stole his lunch. <laughs> I didn't bring up 2017. <laughs> I wasn't going to mention Jesus it. Christ. I wasn't. No, I didn't mention it. Andy, did you bring it up? Uh, yeah, I just I, I did. Yeah, I just think that 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 kind of sums it up, Tommy. And I think when you're looking at the innovation of what Dublin have brought to it, you're looking at the playmakers. We talked about Kilkenny. They give them the ball. They literally give them the ball. I remember one. Well, time, not that day. I, 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 like well, Lee Keegan Lee Keegan absolutely but, but, but we identified it Tommy okay. we identified it we identified that Lee didn't give him the ball I think in 2016 in the first game Jeremy Connolly takes the sideline ball off, off Kieran Kenny and you can just see the Dublin boys going 
look, look at the book at the bottom. Like, he, like he, he's telling you, like the, he got. He we weren't, got, we weren't overly happy with that. Yeah, one. he got grilled for that because Kieran Kilkenny, the ball handler, you give him the ball. No Scully is the ball handler or Fenton, so you give mm. them the ball. That was an injury time sideline yeah. by Connolly yeah, yeah, in, in the seventy first minute. Yeah, so we identified uh, Kilkenny. We could have put Lee on different players who were outstanding at the same time, but we identified Kilkenny on that year of being the main focal point for the Dublin attack, and it really did work for us. And I think he kept him to eight possessions, scored a goal himself, but still Dublin and other fellas around the place that could do the job as well. But I think Kieran that day then, either by his own choice or by the by Jim said, right, let's take Lee Egan out of the game, and they just plonked him out on the wing or in the corner, mm. and you know, so there was there was thinking there as well, you know. He had an incredible performance that day, Lee Keegan. Yeah, he's an incredible player. Mm. You know, and he, he's still doing it. But that time, 15, 16, 17, when we played Dublin, it was like, right, Lee will mark whoever. <laughs> and then everyone else has to do their own job. Yeah. So that was it. And the, 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 but the that, Dublin lads were funny and, good of and you know? What are you talking about that? Like, it's like, he's an amazing player. And he was sacrificing his game. Like, we know how good he is going yeah. forward. And yeah. that's what we were talking last week about defenders now being asked to man mark and get tight and the art of defending and have that little bit of needle in them and you don't really see it that much anymore. Whereas Lee Keegan was totally unselfish in his play. Mm. I'm I'm gonna try and mark Dermot McConnell because he's brilliant for Dublin. And I know I could if I just played my own game, I might be able to go up and score three or four points for play. But that was being hard, that was being a defender, that was making that, that kind of sacrifice for the team, and that's the challenge we had last week and what the first three rounds of the league we're not seeing defenders do that anymore no. we're seeing defenders who are great going forward yeah, which is I, I noticed watch. the same with you the way they no. did it for us I'd, I'd always identify McCarthy as being your heartbeat in terms of no. he, he was the guy that always yeah. knew what to do knew how to sacrifice his game and then everyone else and just yeah like, a just, like amazing players but just yeah. amazing teammates like just they do yeah. end feel like and that's that's what you're hoping to see going into the championship because if teams are going to play this way, they're going to play this open attack in football, you're going to need to have two or three defenders. Like if you're going to win the All Ireland, you're going to have to beat Dublin and you're going to ask one of your full backs to go, you're going to mark Conor Callahan and that's you got to do that. Or if you're going to play Kerry, say Tyrone, win the Ulster Championship, to play Kerry in an All Ireland semi final, they're going to turn around to Rona McNamee or Paula Campsie and say, listen, you're marking Clifford, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what defenders are going to have to do if you want to play this expansive style of play. Players are going to be asked to do that, and it's if they're able to do that, that would be such a huge advantage to that team. Imagine taking out the key score for someone else. That that could win you the game. That could win you the All Ireland. It very nearly won the All Ireland for Mayo in seventeen. Boy, uh, what Lee did, Macker was amazing for us so many times, and with John Small and guys like that. That's what it takes, paying the price. And like I say, you've got to make sacrifices even to your own game. You might want to go forward, but that's that's ultimately what every team needs, those type of players. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 